Good afternoon. My name is Helen Rosenthal, and I chair the Committee on Women, and I'm so pleased to co-chair this hearing with the chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations, Fernando Cabrera. This year, instead of a Mother's Day card, the City Council drafted a legislative package for Mother's Day. It's, it's serious legislation to address a serious imbalance in the workplace. These bills will provide new services and expand existing protections for moms, all parents, and caregivers across the city. Today, the committee will hear six of nine bills from the Mother's Day package. Intro 380, sponsored by Council Member Traeger and co-sponsored by members Ampri Samuel, myself, Combo, Levin, and Reynoso, would require the Department of Administrative Services to provide diapers to residents and service recipients at a number of city-run operations, including city child care centers, family justice centers, living for the young family through education programs, domestic violence shelters, um, and any other uh, programs operated by the Human Resources Administration. Oh, I see, including homeless shelters and youth shelters. Intro 853, sponsored by public advocate Tish James and co-sponsored by council members Kalos, Miller, and Levin, would require the Department of Citywide Administrative Services to conduct a feasibility study and pilot program for offering on-site group childcare options for all city employees. Intro 878, sponsored by Council Member Cornegie and co-sponsored by Council Member Combo, would require lactation rooms in Department of Education schools, police precincts, jail facilities accepting visitors, and jail facilities housing females. Intro 879, sponsored by Council Member Combo and co-sponsored by Members Cornegie, myself, Chin, Rivera, Rose, Ayala, and Ampri Samuel would require employers with more than 15 employees to provide lactation spaces. This expands on state regulations by requiring that the areas are free from intrusion and have access to electricity and that a refrigerator is reasonably close for storing breast milk. Intro 899, sponsored by Council Member Powers and co-sponsored by Council Member Combo, would allow political candidates to use campaign funds, but not public money, for certain child care costs for children under 13 years of age where the candidate is a primary caregiver. Intro 905 sponsored by Council Member Rivera, would require employers to establish lactation accommodation policies and distribute them to all new employees. It would also require the Commission on Human Rights to establish and make available a model lactation accommodation policy. The sponsors will discuss each bill in more detail. Taken together, these are common sense steps to remove the hurdles that women and other caregivers face in the workplace. The message these bills sends is clear. New York City should be the best place in the country to have a child and raise a family and that our city government should have your back. Finally, well-timed, I would be remiss if I did not mention the context in which we are holding this hearing. For while we are fortunate to have an opportunity to make this city a more family-friendly place, our country is faced with a moral crisis 
brought on by the inhumane policy of family separation now in place on our borders. The cruel choice that the president has made to separate mothers and fathers from their children must be reversed. Today, as we consider how to advance protections and services locally, let us also consider our responsibility to guarantee basic human dignity nationally and that we do so daily. Let me thank all the staff who made this hearing possible, including the Committee on Women's Council, Brenda McKinney, Council Austin Branford. He helped out, okay. I didn't see him. Policy analyst, Chloe Rivera, finance analyst, Daniel Krupp, and legal fellow, Rabia Kasim, intern, Jessica Tang, legal intern, Lucy Giliadova, as well as my legislative director, Sean Fitzpatrick, and our legislative interns, Rob Bentlieski and Anissa Ayub, for their work in preparing for this hearing. With that, I'd like to recognize council members Yeager, uh, Powers, Cumbo, um, and now I'd like to turn it over to Chair Cabrera. Thank you. Well, I thought you got to recognize the public advocate. I get to? Okay. I'd also like to recognize uh, our public advocate, Letitia James, who uh, will be speaking in a moment about her legislation, and now Councilwoman Rivera. Thank you so much uh, to my co-chair. Good afternoon and welcome to this joint hearing of the Committee of, of Governmental Operations and Committee on Women. I am Councilmember Fernando Cabrera, chair of, the, ch uh, ch chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations, and I want to thank my co-chair, Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, for her leadership and advocacy and for making today's hearing possible. Three other bills, bills are being heard today are under the Committee on Governmental Operation. I will not <laughs> describe each bill in detail since my co-chair has already listed them for you and each of the sponsors will soon discuss their bill in greater detail. I do, however, want to briefly stress how important the subject of these bills are. Many of these bills were introduced around Mother's Day and are being heard right after Father's Day, but the truth is that in many ways, it is not just individual parents that contribute to raising our children, it is the entire community. The community should not be isolating parents. We should be joining them together to support them. That to me is the heart of this bill, an effort by the community to support the needs of parents. I try to stress that kind of community support in my life outside of the council, and I am proud to be stressing it here as well. We all benefit when that happens. I want to thank the members of both committees and the sponsors of these bills for their commitment to this issue. I also want to thank the staff of both committee, Brad Ree, Lester Bertrand, Zach Harris, Brent, Brenda McKinney, Chloe Rivera, Rabia Kasim, and Daniel Krupp, as well as my own legislative director, Claire McLevain, for all their hard work. I look forward to our discussion on these bills. Thank you. And we also being joined by Council Member Trey. And Brad Lander. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Okay. Uh, public Advocate James. Mm -hmm. First, let me thank uh, the chairs, uh, Chairs uh, Rosenthal and Cabrera, as well as all of the council members, their staff, the committee staff, and of course, a um, member of my staff, Jason Furman. Um, who has been, uh, who drafted this bill. Um, and I also want to thank all of the advocates who are in the audience and I want to thank the administration. For far too long, a failure to provide necessary support has made it harder for women, and especially mothers, to enter or stay, into the, stay in the workforce. And as a government of the most progressive city in the world, we need to do more to change that paradigm. We need to welcome nursing mothers back into the workforce um, by ensuring that they have the support and the privacy that they need. We need to make it easier for struggling families to afford diapers. We need to make it easier for parents with young children to run for office so we are better able to uh, change stagnant institutions in every local level of government. And if that is not more obvious today, then I don't know what is. We need to take a hard look at providing on-site childcare. The little baby said amen, 
Um, so parents have the peace of mind and support they need to do their jobs. The bill that's under consideration that is sponsored um, by the public advocate is intro 853, which would require a comprehensive study of providing on-site child care to city workers, leading to a, um, the bill basically provides for a potential pilot program and hopefully um, to eventually a full-scale adoption of on-site child care for city workers. Nearly half of working parents, parents miss an average of four days of work at least once every six months because of child care breakdowns, costing working families $8.3 billion in lost wages. And unfortunately, but not unsurprisingly, the burden falls mostly heavily, most heavily on working mothers. Three quarters of mothers who leave the workforce cite the lack of affordable child care as the reason why they leave the workforce. And those who seek to return to the workforce often find it impossible to find a job or receive only, or receive only low bail offers, um, low ball offers. So those who stay in the workforce face a motherhood penalty. Let me say that again. Those who stay in the workforce face a motherhood penalty that studies show may be responsible for much of the gender wage gap. By moving towards an on-site child care system, we can ensure that mothers do not need to leave the workforce and send the message that women and their families are valued and respected by the city. Let me also go on to say that, as most of you know, the vast majority of the individuals who work in our wor workforce are women, and the vast majority of women who work for the city of New York, unfortunately, earn less than their male counterparts. And what we need to do is to address the feminization of poverty in our city. And the best that way that we can do that is to provide on-site child care. It would be an enormous step uh, forward and enormous help to all parents in the city workforce and a critical demonstration of the proof of the, of the concept for a much broader expansion. By implementing on-site child care, we could also help agencies because studies have shown that child care, having child, on-site child care decreases absenteeism and increases productivity, knowing that, your fact, knowing that your child is in safe hands. It also represents an enormous step in ending the municipal worker wage gap, which still far outstrips what is found in the private sector. We must find ways to support working families. We must do all that we can do to address um, the wage disparity, the feminization of poverty, and move this city uh, even closer um, to uh, providing for the needs of families in the city of New York. And so I believe these bills represent an important step in the right direction. I thank the chairs, I thank the council, but I particularly want to give a shout out to the Women's Caucus, who has been uh, the leaders in regards to these bills and to the men who serve on the Men Who Get It Committee. Um, and I think the men who are on this committee are all co-chairs, I think they're co-chairs, most of them, uh, the, of the women who are the Men Who Get It Committee, and I thank them greatly for their support. Thank you, Public Advocate, and thank you for that common sense legislation. Very much appreciated. Uh, Majority Leader Cumbo, uh, would you like to talk about intro 878? Nope, 879. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. So pleased to be joined with Councilmember Cabrera, Chair as well. Thank you so much for hosting this hearing. Another member of the Caucus of Men Who Get It has joined us. Hello, Councilmember Carnegie. Raising a child in New York City is really hard. And I know from personal experience, I know exactly what it's like to have all of this experience, all of this talent, all of these titles, and having to choose on a day-to-day -day basis whether to realize your full potential or to take care of your family. And it's a choice that's very much intertwined that so many women across the city of New York have to battle with every single day. You're battling with the fact of, am I a good mom? Am I a great staffer? Am I a great employee? Am I a great boss? It's all of these things that we have to juggle. And child care would be one tool in our toolkit that would help us dramatically in terms of addressing the need of dynamic women being in, whether it's serving in public office or if it's working in our hospitals, our schools, our educational facilities, our academic institutions, the list is endless. 
I was proud to bring forward this Mother's Day package last month on my very own first Mother's Day. I have long been an advocate for women and particularly for mothers, but over the last 10 and a half months, I have experienced firsthand what it takes to care for an infant while also balancing a demanding career, like being the majority leader of the New York City Council. <laughs> Talk about an oxymoron. There are a million different pieces that make up the day-to-day -day caring for an infant, and much of the responsibility falls on women in two or single-parent households. For single mothers, 40% of whom are in poverty, there is still a significant gap in getting the support they need to provide for themselves and their families. We must meet the needs of mothers and meet them right where they are at, such as their workplace. All of these broader goals, such as closing the gender and racial wage gap or increasing the number of women in politics, will not be achieved if we are not looking at what it truly takes for mothers, low income, immigrant, women of color, single mothers, to raise a family in the city. Spaces to lactate outside of their home are a particular barrier for mothers. I know firsthand. We really need breastfeeding hour breaks. While it has long been recognized that there are a number of benefits to breastfeeding for both mother and child, not enough has been done to support mothers in that area. This not only can compromise health outcomes for both mother and child, but it also creates a barrier for mothers looking to return to work, thus impacting the economic security of women and their families. The stigma of breastfeeding in public unfortunately remains a so source of shame and embarrassment for many mothers. Not for me any longer. <laughs> and while a shift in cultural attitudes is needed, we have the opportunity to break down the structural barriers. We say we want mothers in the room, at the table, but are our rooms set up to accommodate mothers and working women? I mean, we are dynamic, amazing, incredible, brilliant, talented, multitaskers. Who wouldn't want us at the table? I would be remiss to mention that as we sit here, our federal government is promoting the inhumane policy of separating migrant children from their parents. I know like many of you, to hear those cries as a mom has got to be one of the most heart-wrenching and heartbreaking things that you can hear or experience, just imagining yourself and your child in that experience. We cannot forget that parenthood and childhood are still a privilege for many, and we must continue to do all that we can to protect and support mothers and children of this city. I'm very proud of many of the bills that we're going to be addressing here today. I'm proud to work with my colleagues on many of these bills, with Councilmember Mark Traeger and the provision of diapers. The bill would require the Department of Citywide Administrative Services to provide to child care, subsidized care centers, family justice centers, Department of Education life programs, domestic violence shelters, and many others to make sure that a supply of diapers is sufficient to meet the needs of the residents. I'm also proud to work with public advocate Letitia James on providing on-site child care for city employees. Proud to work with Councilmember Robert E. Cornegy in requiring lactation rooms in certain city spaces. And we've done tremendous work on this. And I know Robert Cornegy, the father of six children, two of whom are twins, can speak a lot about lactation rooms and the importance <laughs> of breastfeeding. I'm also proud. <laughs> of requiring certain employees uh, to provide lactation spaces in a reasonable proximity to work areas for the purposes of storing breast milk. And of course my colleague Keith Powers recognizing the use of campaign funds for certain child care expenses. We say we want more women to run for office by 2021, but in order to do that, child care has to be front and center in terms of how we make that happen. And Councilmember Carlina Rivera in requiring employees to implement a lactation accommodation policy. So there's so much more work that needs to be done, but this Mother's Day package is an incredible start, and you have 11 women that are city council members in the city of New York. Just imagine when we are more than half and we take over and we have the ability to work with our colleagues and the colleagues of men who get it, working hand in hand, we're going to accomplish even more. So thank you so much, Chair Rosenthal. We are outnumbered here. Thank you so much, Majority Leader Combo. All of those points are absolutely accurate and I appreciate your perspective. There are so many bills but it's because the working world just isn't set up to accommodate women. And so there's work to be done to just take down those barriers. And I appreciate you and your work on that extraordinarily, very, very much. So thank you. I want to welcome Council Members Traeger, Mizell, and Cornegie. 
um, to the hearing. And next, call on Council Member Powers, uh, who is the sponsor of Intro 899. Thank you. Oh, I know we have some more comments. I'll try to keep it quick and short. Um, I introduced a bill a few weeks back, uh, Intro 899, which was in response to a decision by the FEC when they made a landmark decision to allow federal candidates to designate campaign funds for child care costs. Um, this was the start of a trend. And along with Majority Leader Cumbo and many of my colleagues, Councilmember Rosenthal and others, um, introduced a bill to bring this, this ruling at the federal level to our city's local elections, permitting campaign funds to be used for certain child care expenses when the candidate is the primary caregiver. As we've discussed, running for office, as many of us up here know, is both fiscally and emotionally taxing, even more so while raising a child. And reducing some of the burden can mean the difference between running for office or not. This bill would benefit any primary caregiver interested in running for city office, but I believe would particularly would improve the experience for women. Um, more than 40% of women responded to a survey saying that at some point in their working life, they have reduced their hours in order to care for a child or other family member. For men, it was 28%. Given that the mother is the breadwinner in more than half of New York City households, this represents a significant barrier to female candidates. And as we've discussed, right now this, there, we have the fewest number of women at 11 that it has had in any point in the last 20 years. But by removing one obstacle in the process of running for office, we can make it easier to increase representation in a body that we all know desperately needs it. Um, this bill has the support of Planned Parenthood, the National Organization of Women, and 21 and 21, amongst others, in addition to the number of the colleagues who are here today. I believe it's an important step in encouraging new parents to enter public service and to remove an important, uh, and to, and to remove a obstacle for, for anyone who's looking at running for office in the future. And I really do believe it serves mothers very well, but serves fathers as well. And we have a number of city council members here who are new parents, and I believe understand that, that the balance and that challenge. Um, I uh, wanted to just very quickly thank my staff for working on this, and I also wanted to thank the staff at the council and the campaign finance board for engaging with us on this issue and discussing ways that we can work through to make this work for candidates as we enter into a campaign cycle in 2121, which I know nobody in this room knows anything about. Uh, so thank you. Thank you to Chair Rosenthal. Thank you to Chair Cabrera. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Council Member Powers. Next, we're going to hear from Council Member Traeger, uh, who is the lead sponsor on Intro 380. Thank you uh, to the Committee on Women Chair Helen Rosenthal and Committee on Governmental Operations Chair uh, Cabrera uh, for hosting today's hearing and for hearing uh, my bill, Intro 380. Uh, we know that it's more expensive than ever to raise a family in our city, and diapers are a costly uh, necessity. Having clean diapers for your children is not a luxury, but a basic need. My bill would require the Department of Citywide Administrative Services to provide to child subsidized day, uh, care centers, family justice centers, Department of Education, life programs, domestic violence shelters operated by HRA, and shelters operated by the Department of Homeless Services and the Department of Youth and Community Development, a supply of diapers that is sufficient to meet the needs of the residents and service recipients of those programs. Diapers are an expensive necessity and low-income families struggle to afford them. The cost of diapers can especially be a hardship for single parents and studies show that moms who struggle to afford diapers are more likely to have depression. No parent should ever have to choose between paying rent and buying clean diapers for their child. This is urgent, especially since I have heard from advocates that parents have lost custody of their children simply because they couldn't afford clean diapers. Our city became a better and more equal place about two years ago when the city council passed legislation that provided free feminine hygiene products for people across our city. Like feminine hygiene products, diapers are also a necessity. Our city must show basic decency pro by providing clean diapers to families. This is really just a common sense issue. No baby should have to be in a dirty diaper when our city could easily step up and make sure clean diapers are available. Um, I'd like to also just note that the, the inspiration or, or the in behind this legislation was a member of my staff, Samantha, was working on a case trying to help a single mom find housing. And during the course of the case, the single mom w was asking her if we could help provide her child with 
clean diapers. And I was really appalled to learn how this was not readily available for families. In a city that has now an $89 billion budget, and we've done a lot of good things when it comes to food emergencies and dealing with this, we're talking about diapers, we're talking about basic needs, talking about our children and our families. Anything that helps our kids and our parents and our families is good for the entire city of New York. So I'd like to thank the chairs, and I'd like to also commend all of my colleagues whose important bills are being heard today as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember, and I want to welcome Councilmember Zayala and um, Councilmember Perkins uh, for joining us today. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Councilmember Rivera on her bill, Intro 905. Thank you, Councilmember. Thank you. Chairs Rosenthal and Cabrera, thank you very much for granting me the opportunity to speak in support of Intro 905, which I introduced to the Council on May 9th. This bill would require employers in the city to establish policies describing lactation accommodations and the process by which an employee can request such accommodation. The bill would also require employers to distribute these policies to all new employees maintain records of written requests for a lactation space and require the city's Commission on Human Rights to establish and make available a model lactation accommodation policy. The benefits of breastfeeding to both mother and infant are well established with studies showing that it significantly contributes to better maternal and child health outcomes. Unfortunately, women face a number of challenges when it comes to breastfeeding in the workplace. Women still face a stigma and may prefer to nurse in private and not among their colleagues even though state and federal law does permit nursing in public. This can lead to challenges for working mothers to find time or private space to breastfeed, which can unduly and unfairly impact their careers. This bill would uniformly clarify to employees their rights regarding lactation accommodations and create clear standards for employers to follow. These accommodations require a basic and sanitary space, something any employer can and should be able to provide. If we are going to be the fairest big city in America, we must continue to pass legislation like this Mother's Day package that address the financial and career challenges that women face in addition to accessing, to accessing quality health care and child care. We need to ensure that women can access the same financial opportunities and paths to career advancement as their colleagues in the workplace. And whether it's men or whether it's whatever population or community that you identify with, you know, family planning is something that should be included in, in, in your rights and your policies where you work, and that's, I think, how we create a really fair city. We need women to feel that they can apply for any job, they can run for any seat, any office, or even take a seat in the boardroom while they're still caring for a family, whether it's one or it's six. I'm excited to be participating in today's hearing, and again, thank you for the opportunity to testify in this important package of bills, and I do look forward to strengthening some of the language in this legislation, whether it's working with the Commission on Gender Equity, the agencies in the room, and of course, the council staff, our own personal staff that take so much time to make sure that we are here to give comments that are thoughtful and that are reasonable. So I do ask that my colleagues support this package as it moves through the council, and again, thanks so much for the time. Thank you, Councilwoman. And next, we're going to hear from uh, Councilmember Cornegie about his bill that he's sponsoring, uh, 878, um, which is a continuation on your leadership about lactation rooms. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, so I just want to start with a personal note. This all began for me many years ago when I uh, watched uh, my wife and the mother of my children come home and literally cry because while working for some of the top executive law firms in the city, she found herself expressing milk for my children in uh, broom closets and in unsanitary bathrooms. And I made a promise then before I was elected that if I ever was elected, um, I would make sure that there were spaces provided not only in my office, uh, but throughout the city. And in my office, uh, when we did the architectural designs we didn't convert a broom closet into a lactation station. We actually did a build out uh, for that, which I'm very proud of. Um, I'm proud to have uh, the first public lactation station in a government office in the state of New York, um, which 
uh, was very exciting. And the unintended consequence, I mean, un unintended benefit there was that we had mothers and still have mothers who come on a daily basis solely to express milk and to store it till the end of the day. So there are w working women in the area of my district office who avail themselves of that facility, not for the purpose of breastfeeding, but for expressing milk to store so that they can take home either to their caregivers or have it just on storage in, in, in just in case. So as a husband and father of six, I believe strongly that women should be supported as new mothers to breastfeed their children. They should have access to safe, clean, sanitary spaces to breastfeed their children. I was proud to open the fir first public lactation station in the government office in this city, in my district office in 2015, and I'm proud today to speak in support of two bills that will expand the provision of safe lactation stations to nursing mothers across this city. In 2016, I was proud to be the prime sponsor of Intro 1063, now Local Law 94, which requires DOHMH to provide dedicated lactation rooms for nursing mothers in all their health centers, as well as in job centers, SNAP centers, and medical assistance program centers of DSS and HRA, among others. The first bill, Intro 878, which I'm proud to co-prime alongside an outstanding mom, Majority Leader Cumbo, will expand its provision to school buildings and city jobs. The second, which I'm also proud to have introduced with Majority Leader Cumbo, as well as Council Members Rosenthal, Chin, Rivera, Rose, Ayala, and Ampri Samuel, will make safe, clean, dedicated spaces for use by breastfeeding mothers available to more women in the private sector. Every day, we in government espouse the importance of giving our children the best opportunity to succeed in life. As we have become increasingly aware of a myriad of benefits associated with breastfeeding, it's only appropriate that we do everything in our power to stick to our word. And this means empowering moms to be able to safely and healthily breastfeed their children. Nursing mothers deserve to have access to safe, clean, comfortable space to breastfeed or express breast milk. If you care about the health and well-being of our children, then we have to care about the health and well-being of their mothers too. These bills demand the support of anyone who cares about the future of our children, and I look forward to, their, to them becoming law. I'd just like to add on a personal note that I find it ironic that this Mother's Day uh, group of bills comes right after Father's Day. <laughs> Get used to it, Council Member. Uh, thank you so much, Council Member Cornegy. Um, I'm now going to ask the Committee Council for Government Operations to uh, give the oath and then hear from our panel. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask that you introduce yourselves. And is there, uh, Laura, do you need to leave early? No, not in particular. Okay. Um, Jackie, you want to start? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairs Rosenthal and Cabrera and Public Advocate James. I am Jacqueline Ebanks, Executive Director of New York City's Commission on Gender Equity. In this role, I also serve as an advisor to the Mayor and First Lady on policies and issues around gender equity in the city. I'm pleased to be joined today by my colleagues from the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, DCAS, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, DOHMH, and the City's Commission on Human Rights, who will also offer testimony on the package of bills before you today. I would like to acknowledge the leadership of Councilmember Helen Rosenthal and Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, who serve as CGE commissioners. Their partnership since I became Executive Director in August 2017 has been invaluable to the progress the Commission has made and the strides the city continues to make in advancing gender equity. Additionally, I'd like to congratulate Councilmember Diana Ayala and Carlina Rivera for their recent appointments to the commission. I look forward to working with each of you as we build an equitable city for all New Yorkers, regardless of gender identity or expression. Ensuring a fairer and more equitable city has been the principal goal of the de Blasio administration. To that end, the administration has partnered with the City Council to develop and pass historic legislation that advances gender equity and builds a family-friendly city. I want to take a few minutes to sort of go over some of our key accomplishments. Together, we have passed, since 2014, 
we have been able to pass legislation to ban all employers from inquiring about job applicant salary history. We've been able to expand paid sick leave to many of the lowest paid industries that employ a disproportionate number of women. We've also been able to expand paid sick leave to include paid safe leave so that victims of domestic violence, sexual violence, stalking, and human trafficking can get paid time off to respond to the various challenges that result from gender-based violence. We also now as a city provide six weeks of fully paid parental leave to city employees, and we provide free full day pre-K available for all New Yorkers. We, as you've noted, also have established publicly accessible lactation rooms in city facilities. These foster family-friendly workplaces and we have stronger protections for pregnant employees and parents. Earlier this year, we now require diaper changing stations in all restrooms to be installed in new and heavily renovated buildings in the city. And we now ensure that our workplaces are free from sexual harassment and violence with some of the toughest laws in the nation. This Mother's Day package of bills before you today continues the city's march towards gender equity. The package of bills offers the administration and the city council the opportunity to partner once again in making historic strides for our city's families. The administration finds high alignment with the values and the goals of the bills included in the Mother's Day package. However, on deeper analysis of some of these bills, we see the complexities to implementation that the initiatives uh, require, and as such, necessitate further discussion, evaluation, and collaboration. The administration would like to offer about three recommendations regarding strengthening the bill, specifically intros 380, 853, 878, 879, and 905. First, we'd like to encourage reviewing and streamlining the current state of operations for the provisions of goods and services provided in intros 380 and 878. This includes synchronizing language around contracting and procurement for the proposed distribution of diapers in intro 380, and holding further conversations regarding the potential limitations and concerns some agencies have around implementing a one-size-fits-all policy as proposed in Intro 878. The administration is supportive of the intent of Intro 878 and has worked in partnership with the council to create supportive environments where women are comfortable to breastfeed or express milk whenever or wherever needed. The administration is, however, concerned about limitations of existing agency space. Many agencies in Intro 878 have significant and in many cases dated infrastructure throughout our city. We would like to work with the council to give these agencies flexibility to determine which of their sites can accommodate a des designated lactation room for the public. The, uh, in prior discussions regarding these bills, when, we, when Local Law 94 was passed in 2016, it was acknowledged that there were legal and operational obstacles for some agencies that require further attention. The administration is indeed continuing to look into these legal and operational obstacles and looks forward to continuing to work with the City Council on these questions. The second recommendation for uh, strengthening the bills applies to Intro 853. We would like to suggest the establishment of a working group to allow for deliberate assessment and thorough research for the proposed muni municipal child care study and pilot initiative. This working group would expand the number of agencies at the table and increase the number of stakeholders so that we can sort of collectively come up with the best possible response to the childcare needs of New York City workers, which we do agree is a critical issue that should be addressed. Uh, we believe, however, that it's, it's not solely the purview of one city agency, but that we all should be at the table, including the voices of the employees themselves. Third, regarding intro 8879 and 905, would want to encourage our reviewing and reconciliation of language 
as, uh, which are, as currently drafted, in conflict with current law. For example, intro 879 would set a higher threshold regarding the size of businesses impacted than current law, which now requires businesses with employees of four and above, the law says 15, the, the proposed legislation says 15. And uh, also 905 currently limits um, current uh, protections regarding undue hardships. So we really would like to look at that and ensure that there is deeper alignment with current laws with, with the proposed legislation. Our concern is that if any or all the above conditions are not sufficiently in focus, we risk faulty development and poor implementations of these bills. We look forward to working with the Council to address these concerns so that the objectives of these bills can be achieved in the most effective and practical ways. I appreciate the opportunity to provide testimony before you today and welcome questions as well as any further discussions on the policies and the initiatives proposed. We, the Administration, look forward to continuing discussions with the Council and with the agencies tasked in the legislation to assure appropriate execution. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chairs Rosenthal and Cabrera, and Public Advocate James, and members of the committees. My name is Laura Ringelheim. I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Real Estate Services at the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. I'm joined today by my colleague, Mercita Ibrick, who's the Deputy Commissioner of Procurement at DCAS. And we're here today to discuss intros 853 and 380. Intro 853. While this administration supports the intent of Intro 853 as currently drafted, DCAS would be limited in its ability to comply. We urge the Council to consider the development of a working group to better understand the goals and parameters of the feasibility study, as well as the pilot program. I would like to take this time to explain some of the challenges that are presented by the bill. First, while DCAS may be the appropriate agency to search for available city-owned or controlled space for the program, this proposed pilot is far outside DCAS's scope in the following ways. Designing architectural plans for child care operations, finding vendors that run these programs, and assessing costs for such contracts or operations. In fact, when the city cites daycare or early learn facilities, DCAS only handles the real estate transaction, and the relevant agency is responsible for its functions. We would welcome the opportunity to sit down with the Council to see if this bill could be crafted in a way to make such a feasibility study meaningful and possible. We also believe that any bill that is passed by the Council should include definitions for what is meant by city-owned or city-controlled spaces. DCAS currently operates and maintains 55 city-owned buildings, approximately 50% of which are occupied by city agencies for office use, and 50% are occupied by the Office of Court Administration for court functions. In addition, there are currently more than 7,000 buildings in the city's real estate portfolio. While some of these buildings do not house city employees, many of them, including police precincts, firehouses, hospitals, and colleges do, and DCAS has no jurisdiction over those sites. Also, while we manage 7.2 million square feet of court space, DCAS has no authority to develop programming in that space. Only OCA, which is a state agency, can decide what services will be offered and who will occupy that space. Many city-controlled spaces that are used for city operations are lease spaces in privately owned buildings. Often the city occupies only a portion of the building, or in some instances, the spaces are leased for agencies that are providing services to the public. These leases commonly have defined terms that limit additional uses beyond what's identified in the lease. This limitation makes citing a daycare facility extremely difficult. Because of this, we urge City Council to consider eliminating lease spaces from the bill. If Council would like to include them, we would welcome the opportunity to engage in meaningful dialogue about how to develop criteria for site selection. Additionally, we believe that any bill that is passed should provide more information as to the population that will be served. There are different rules and regulations that govern the operation of a daycare center in New York. And often, these regulations differ depending on the age of the children who are being served. So we recommend that Intro 853 define the intended population. Finally, there's a very limited supply of vacant city-owned spaces. DCAS continually strives to achieve maximum utilization of city-owned space by renovating and reconfiguring existing space wherever possible. Where we have identified pockets of available space, we have slated them for agency operations after renovation. Because of space constraints, to ensure agencies have the resources that they need, we often have to rely on lease spaces. 
So putting a daycare in city-owned space would almost certainly require relocating agencies to a leased space. Regarding intro 380, this administration supports the intent of intro 380, and DCAS currently has in place a contract for diapers. This contract is available to all city agencies, but unfortunately, procurement rules do not allow for DCAS to make these goods directly available to non-government entities. We recommend adding language to the bill that makes clear that DCAS, upon request, will make diapers available to city agencies, and that the agencies would ensure that the vendors who are running these programs would receive them as needed. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on these important topics. We look forward to working with the council and will gladly answer any questions. Good afternoon, Chairs Rosenthal and Cabrera and members of the committee. I am Dr. Torian Easterling, Assistant Commissioner of the Brooklyn Health Action Center within the Center for Health Equity at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. On behalf of Commissioner Bassett, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify on the topic of breastfeeding and its many public health benefits. I would also like to especially thank our Brooklyn legislators who I have worked closely with who have been breastfeeding champions, Councilmember Carnegie and Majority Leader Cumbo. Uh, it is a priority of the department to promote breastfeeding, also referred to as feeding infants breasts or human milk, as a way to improve the health of infants and mothers. Exclusive breastfeeding or feeding infants, only breasts or human milk, is recommended for the first six months of life. And continued infant feeding with breast or human milk is encouraged until one year of age or longer. Babies who are breastfed or are less likely to experience medical problems, such as respiratory illness and ear infections. Additionally, studies suggest that people who breastfeed are less likely to develop breast and ovarian cancer and cardiovascular disease. However, Many people who want to breastfeed face barriers to continue and exclusive breastfeeding, which can lead to disparities in breastfeeding rates for low-income communities and communities of color. Although the majority of people in New York City initiate breastfeeding and continue to breastfeed their babies for at least eight weeks, racial disparities in breastfeeding continuation exist, especially with exclusive breastfeeding. Rates of exclusive breastfeeding eight weeks after birth were 26.2% for Latina mothers, 27.9% for Asian Pacific Islander mothers, and 27.9% for black non-Latino mothers. And this is compared to 42.9% for white non-Latino mothers. The department has several initiatives to encourage breastfeeding. We offer breastfeeding education, support, and pumps to new mothers through our, our home visiting programs. We develop and distribute educated educational materials and information to providers and the general public about breastfeeding. We work closely with community-based organizations to build local capacity to support breastfeeding and offer trainings to local health care providers, hospital staff, and uh, field workers. We also offer a lactation program for our own employees, including lactation rooms and a loaner breast pump program at Department of Health offices. In addition, the New York City Breastfeeding Hospital Collaborative works to increase the number of maternity facilities that achieve the World Health Organization and UNICEF baby-friendly designation. This designation is achieved when a facility offers an uh, optimal level of care for infant care and feeding and mother-to-baby bonding. To date, 16 New York City hospitals and birthing centers, including non-health and hospitals, offer the optimal level of care for infant care and feeding and mother-baby bonding to warrant achieving this prestigious designation. We are working hard to address this issue directly in key neighborhoods. The Brooklyn Breastfeeding Empowerment Zone trains community members to support breastfeeding parents and families and activates faith-based leaders, small businesses, policymakers, and others to ensure that every mother and baby has the opportunity to experience the health benefits of breastfeeding and to reduce the racial disparities and ethnic disparities that we know exist in breastfeeding. Another program, Creating Breastfeeding Friendly Communities, targets our three neighborhood health action center neighborhoods, Brownsville, East Harlem, and the South Bronx. Engaging child care centers and daycare homes, work sites, and outpatient clinical practices to make sure that we can achieve the breastfeeding friendly designation in accordance with guidelines established by the New York State Department of Health. In addition, our neighborhood health action centers as I mentioned, in Brownsville, East Harlem, and South Bronx, offer community lactation rooms, as well as breastfeeding education and support. Last year, we opened five lactation pods around the city, 
at Health and Hospitals, Queens Hospital Center, Harlem Hospital Center, the Bronx Zoo, the Staten Island Children's Museum, and the Brooklyn Children's Museum. The pods are part of the department's efforts to promote and support breastfeeding and ensure that mothers feel comfortable breastfeeding and bre pumping and breastfeeding wherever they choose. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Easterly. Yep. Good afternoon, Chairpersons Rosenthal and Cabrera, Public Advocate James, and the members of the committees. My name is Hollis Fitch, and I am the Deputy Commissioner for Law Enforcement at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Although the Commission doesn't regularly testify before your committees, we are happy, happy to join you today and to speak in favor of intros 879 and 905. The New York City Commission on Human Rights is a city agency charged with enforcing the city's anti-discrimination and anti-harassment protections in virtually all areas of the city, including employment, housing, places of public accommodation, on the street, and other public areas within New York City. As the Deputy Commissioner for the Law Enforcement Bureau, I'm in charge of all the law enforcement investigations and litigation at the Commission. All of the law enforcement at the agency is civil law enforcement, which means that the remedies sought by the city or intervening complainants are limited to money damages, affirmative and injunctive relief, and civil penalties. Currently, the New York City Human Rights Law, which is the body of anti-discrimination and anti-harassment protections we enforce, requires that employers reasonably accommodate the needs of an employee for her pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical condition that will allow the employee to perform the essential requisites of the job, provided that such employee's pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical condition is known or should have been known by the employer. And this is laid out in the Administrative Code 8107, Section 22. More than two years ago, on May 6, 2016, the Commission released legal enforcement guidance expressly making clear that lactation and expressing breast milk are covered accommodations under the law. Quoting from our guidance, lactation is a medical condition related to childbirth and therefore must be accommodated absent an undue hardship. Employers must provide reasonable time for an employee to express breast milk and may not limit the amount of time that an individual can use to express milk unless the employer can demonstrate that the time needed presents an undue hardship to the employer. In addition, absent undue hardship, an employer must provide a clean, sanitary, and private space other than a bathroom that is shielded from view and free from public intrusion from coworkers, along with a refrigerator to store breast milk in the workplace. A lactation space must be conveniently located and reasonably near the employee's workstation. An employee who wishes to express milk at their usual workstation shall be permitted to do so as long as it does not create an undue hardship for the employer, regardless of whether a coworker, client, or customer expresses discomfort. Where an employer already provides compensated breaks, an employee who uses that break time to express milk must be compensated in the same way that other employees are compensated for break time. The Commission supports intros 879 and 905 to the extent that they are consistent with our current law and legal enforcement guidance. However, both bills are drafted in ways that would actually provide less protection than is currently available under the law. If that is truly the intention of the bills, the Commission is interested in understanding the Council's reasoning behind those limitations as we are generally not supportive of proposals that would limit the current application of the law. Specifically, current law requires employers with four or more employees to provide lactation spaces to employees, while intro 879 only applies to employers of 15 or more employees. We're interested in understanding the reason behind this proposed change to the law. Similarly, intro 905 allows employers to wait five business days before responding to a request for lactation space. Waiting five days before expressing milk at work could result in severe pain, difficulties with continued lactation, or other issues. Under current law, waiting five days before responding to a request for lactation space for a currently lactating employee who needs the space at the, at the time would likely constitute evidence of bad faith on behalf of the employer and could result in employer liability under the city human rights law. As such, we're interested in understanding the reasoning behind codifying a five-day wait period for employers to respond to those accommodation requests. We're concerned that legislating a specific response time could actually limit existing protections, which in many instances would require now employers to respond more quickly. Currently, the reasonable accommodation process requires a case-by-case -case individualized assessment for how quickly an employer should respond to an accommodation request. Also, intro 879 outlines an undue hardship standard that differs from human rights law section 8102, section 18. 
That different standard may be interpreted to limit current coverage rather than expand it and could create confusion since other pregnancy-related accommodations would continue to be subject to the current undue hardship standard. The current standard applied in situations where an employee requests a lactation space or accommodations related to pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions has been useful in enforcement of the law. As such, we're interested in understanding why council believes there should be a different standard for this specific pregnancy, childbirth related accommodation. Overall, however, I wish to reinforce the commission's support for providing accommodations for employees' pregnancy, childbirth, or other related medical conditions, and will be happy to work with council to make sure these bills do not contract the current protections. As a champion of women's rights in the workplace, the commission has consistently prioritized strong enforcement and outreach to combat discrimination based on pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. On May 27, 2018, in a letter to the editor of the New York Times, our Commissioner Carmelin P. Malalas reminded us that, the New York City, that New York City is home to some of the strongest workplace protections in the country for expecting and current mothers and caregivers, and encouraged people to come forward to file complaints when they experience such discrimination. Also noting that the Commission has increased investigations in this area by more than 34 percent in the last two years. Pregnancy discrimination, however, remains rampant, and the Commission wants to seize this opportunity to consider how we can ensure accountability in the workplace and make certain that places of employment are welcoming and supportive places for expecting mothers and caretakers. The Commission recently released a report combating sexual harassment in the workplace, trends and recommendations based on 2017 public hearing testimony, which was the result of a public hearing we held on December 6, 2017, where over 27 members of the public, including representatives from advocacy groups, activists, and workers from a wide range of industries, shared their experience of sexual har harassment on the job. Centering the narratives of the unique experiences of workers and taking the opportunity to really listen to how people experience sexual harassment on the ground has enabled us to think, think through strategic and community-centered approaches to our effort to end workplace harassment. We look forward to working together with the administration and the city council to consider how we can continue to advance and protect the rights and needs of workers based on their pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. Thank you so much to all of you for your thoughtful insights, your suggestions. We look forward to working with you during the legislative process. I'm delighted to hear that for the most part, there's um, a lot of agreement and excitement about this new legislation. Um, I have just a couple questions and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Um, in terms of the Public Advocates Bill 853, uh, you know, employees of the City of Boston are offered child care services for children from three months to seven years old at Boston City Hall. The U.S. General Services Administration offers child care services to federal employees uh, for, just for the record, a very good friend of mine uh, used those uh, services when she was an assistant attorney general and the name of the child care center was called Just Us Kids, which I thought was cute. Three of their sites are um, for the U.S. government are in New York City. Has DCAS or the mayor's office discussed the creation of on-site child care for city employees with uh, these or similar government entities? As an administration, we certainly, as you know, uh, council member, care a great deal about ensuring a family-friendly workplace and ensuring that this city becomes a place where individuals, regardless of gender identity and expression, are able to enjoy fully uh, lives where they indeed can thrive. The actual specific consideration of uh, city employee childcare based on those models has not yet uh, been uh, discussed, but we are indicating here that we are in support of the concept and want to ensure that it is a fully it's a broadly discussed issue and not solely resting with one uh, agency. And uh, that, that's really, I think, our position that, yes, we would like to engage in that discussion, but ensure that it's something that's done citywide across all our agencies to determine what's the best model for New York City, which employs close to 400,000 individuals, which is significantly large, larger than Boston and D.C. or the federal government. 
I would just add to that that um, the GSA provides similar services to what uh, DCAS provides. Currently, as it's structured, DCAS doesn't have that uh, programmatic knowledge. So I think what we're saying is that there are other agencies that might be better equipped at least to weigh in here on where um, the, the structure and the main support for those programs should lie, and that DCAS would really just be the real estate service provided to accomplishing that. Thank you. Um, and then in relation to the three lactation bills, intro 878, intro 879, and 905, there is now a list. Oh, I'd like to recognize Council Member Rodriguez, who's joined us as well. There is now a list of accessible lactation rooms made available to members of the public via the city's website. Thank you. Have you, has anyone considered creating a mobile app for greater accessibility or offering directions or a map of some sort? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, we are in constant contact with our uh, uh, colleagues in ACS and DSS. Uh, we are constantly putting and updating that list on our website, and we do want to make sure that we have it available uh, for mobile uh, usage. Um, we are also talking with some contractors about, uh, about potential opportunities to link their existing resources that the agency doesn't necessarily uh, lead and operate, but I think there's an opportunity for us to work with organizations that already provide this information. Um, we have been also talking with uh, other um, entities like Yelp uh, to make sure that we can expand uh, the opportunity to designate spaces, um, restaurants, small businesses as lactation spaces as well. Anyone else working with, okay. Some entrepreneur is watching this and is going to make this happen. Thank you, whoever you are. Um, and lastly, according to data released by the health department, and as you testified, Dr. Easterling, women of color and women from high poverty neighborhoods in New York City are less likely to breastfeed exclusively during the first five days after giving birth. Babies born to mothers who live in higher income areas were 1.6 times more likely to be exclusively breastfeeding within the first five days as compared with babies from lower income neighborhoods. What does the administration attribute this difference to and what steps are you taking currently um, to address this difference? Uh, thank you again for that question. Uh, and why uh, these, um, these bills are so important uh, is because we know that women need to have the opportunity and we need to make the norm that women can breastfeed anytime and anywhere. Uh, the first five days is very important as I shared uh, our work within hospitals uh, to make hospitals a baby friendly designation uh, is so important to increase the mother to baby bonding time as well as to ensure that resources are available to mothers so they know how to um, uh, infant feeding. Uh, and so the opportunities within these hospitals are to provide the right type of education and messaging. We know that is a barrier. Also resources is also a barrier so we want to make sure that uh, the mothers know if there are any challenges with breastfeeding, how they can continue, and we want to promote uh, what breastfeeding can and what the challenges may be. Uh, and so also offering home visiting programs once the mother is discharged, that someone will be able to visit them in their home and help them when those challenges exist as well. Um, but I also know that sometimes mother has your mother has to return back to work. And so again, the leadership of this council has made sure that we have paid family leave. And so when uh, mothers do have to return to work, that there is an opportunity and we have lactation spaces available, which is a priority for the department as well. I appreciate that. And I appreciate that, you're, uh, that you'll be testifying at, at the committee on women's next hearing about um, maternal uh, um, outcomes during childbirth. Um, I was hoping you were going to add to your response that a hospital should be not just, what, did, what was the expression you, child-centered? Baby-centered. 
a baby centric, baby friendly designation, baby centric, but that it should also be mother centric. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that we've been learning is that there is not just implicit bias, but explicit bias on behalf of the medical profession um, as to who should be educated about the importance of any of a number, any of a myriad issues on, um, on birthing and, and, then, and then lactation and, and the taking care of the child. And um, what I would hope is that the Department of Health would um, maybe in starting with H&H &H, be working to educate physicians mm -hmm. about um, removing that explicit bias um, so that every mother, regardless of the color of their skin, would get the same education about the importance of breastfeeding. I couldn't have said it better. Thank you for that, for raising that point. Okay, I appreciate that. I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues. Council Member? Thank you so much, uh, Co-Chair. Uh, Jackie, I have a quick question that I'm kind of scratching my head over here on page three in your second suggestion. Uh, you mentioned establishing a working group to allow for deliberate assessment and thorough research for the proposed municipal child care study and pilot initiative in intro 853 by engaging other agencies and stakeholders in the process. So uh, I'll tell you my hesitation and, and then what I believe the process should be instead of. The problem that I have with working groups is that often they become eternal working groups. They could go on forever and ever and ever and when you're going through all of the forevers, then an amen uh, after that. Um, the whole point of, I mean, in terms of whenever we pass bills, the lowest bar that I see often here is a study. Mm -hmm. to, so the whole point of the study could involve working groups. So why have a working group when it should be part of the study in the first place? I appreciate that explanation of the bill. As reading it now, it, it simply said DCAS has the responsibility to the study. And so one of the things we wanted to suggest that it really is a broader responsibility uh, than solely DCAS, uh, recognizing the complexity of the issue as was stated in, in uh, her remarks. So I think we're on the same page. Um, the bill also gives some time frame and that would and I agree with you, we don't want a working group that goes on in perpetuity. We need to make some decisions and respond to the needs of our mothers in city government, and we, we care greatly about that. So um, I think there isn't disagreement on intent. Uh, we would really want to be clarifying process and expectation so that uh, we can better uh, execute on the outcomes of the bill. The yeah, bill. From, Laura, you want to say something? Well, I was just going to add to that because I think the bill requires certain, um, cert not just the study, but certain things happen in a certain amount of time. If we were going to, uh, if DCAS was just going to find the space, it would require like relocating the agency. That would require finding more space for that agency so this could be located in a city-owned space. So that wouldn't meet the time frame set out right now uh, by the legislation. Additionally, to procure vendors, because I'm not the expert, but I'm not sure that we have those vendors in place and it wouldn't require a procurement process to get those into place. That might also not be accomplished within that time frame. So and that list that you're giving me right now could be, it could go on and on and on. That's the whole point of the study. Uh, so for me to have a working group before the study, it kind of, uh, you know, creates this silo effect to, to take, to kind of hold the bill hostage uh, from where I'm sitting. I prefer, and I'm gonna encourage the sponsor of the bill to move forward with the study, because studies, I, it covers everything you mentioned and much more, and uh, it literally uh, could embrace all of the other possibilities that we're not even looking at here. And so, I only have one question, uh, Madam uh, Chair, because uh, I really want to hear the sponsor of the, of the bills. 
uh, answer your question. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Care Chair Cabrera. We're now going to hear from uh, Council Members Cumbo, Traeger, and Yeager. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal and Cabrera. I want to just start with a, a statement because I understand that our city agencies and the buildings that we're looking at were built at a time where the value of women um, was not at the forefront of the architectural design of New York City. But I just want to state that we can't allow that wrong to continue to dictate how we move forward. So we have to continue to dig deep to find solutions to the fact that we want to have women, mothers, the disabled, and everyone to be a part of the dynamic of the New York City workforce. So with my first question um, is around public advocate uh, Letitia James's uh, legislation. Um, wanted to ask, so are you looking at it from the standpoint of if every single a city agency, even though we're talking about a pilot right now, which I think is what we need to also stay focused on, but are we looking at it from the standpoint of if it can't happen in a certain building, are we looking at buildings within the vicinity that would have the ability to have child daycare where multiple city agency employees would be able to use a particular space within a one or two block radius of where they're uh, currently employed at? And so are, are you asking if, if, there, if we can identify those buildings um, and, and assess the city employee need at, at that, is that really, so I just wanted to narrow the question. Right, so like let's say we're here, the city council is here at 250 Broadway. Many of the mayor's offices are at 253 Broadway. Maybe there's no space at 250, but maybe there's space at 253. Is there an opportunity to maybe look at space at 253 and to, or maybe even here at City Hall to say, perhaps some spaces are available that all three of these entities could utilize for the purposes of childcare. I mean, I know just from now being a part of the network and being a part of the world, there are a lot of city employees in between these three spaces that could certainly benefit um, from uh, childcare. I'm not just asking for myself. For everybody. No, uh, and I think again, we're, we're in agreement that um, this is indeed a worthwhile effort in which to engage. The challenge, uh, if you will, and that's probably too strong a word, is that we, we want to encourage that more players need to be at the table. Such as? The, such as um, the Commission on Gender Equity, such as ACS, such as, um, you know, I'd love to learn from the nonprofit community that has a deep bench strength in providing childcare services. Um, so I think there are many other players to bring to the table and um, the, the current structure of the bill sort of says DCAS has this responsibility. Now, we may be semantics here, uh, because what we'd like to say is that the working group, uh, the concept, is that it brings more players to the tables. You get exactly the diversity of thought that you just brought, but maybe the timeline suggested should be to this working group structure versus the, the sole responsibility of DCAS. Are, th are there current uh, buildings within the portfolio that have already implemented child daycare programs, such as the one that we're talking about legislating? No, we don't have any of that in our portfolio. There's, there's ACS leased and owned sites that provide daycare, not exclusively for city employees. So the answer to your question is no. Um, but DCAS could play a role in assessing its buildings and its portfolio to see what space is available. Um, but then again, there are lots of other sites that might be more appropriate that are not included here, which is why we think that there should be other agencies involved. It's um, with you know 7,000 properties, it, it shouldn't all lie on DCAS when we don't have the ability to do that kind of analysis. Well, I think that you may not have the analysis to do all of that, but I do agree that we have to start somewhere. And I believe that it's important that we figure out because um, it takes time to build out facilities like that to have the appropriate players um, in place. But I do agree that we should add additional people to, to the team to look at this. But I, 
similar to Councilmember Cabrera, this is a need of serious uh, timing. Yeah. The, the growing workforce of women continues to grow. The amount of women that are now working with children continues to grow rapidly, probably one of the fastest growing populations in our workforce, and we have to meet the needs and the demands of that workforce as quickly as possible. So I wanted to ask, um, in addition to that, um, I wanted to just switch, but I want to go back to this issue because it also has to do with uh, lactation spaces as well. Um, when I came home uh, from having my son, I, th I got a lot of information from the hospital about La Leche. And La Leche is a service that um, teaches you how to breastfeed um, by going to certain classes. Now I just break it down for you because that was revolutionary to me. I'd never heard of this. So you have an opportunity to go to different classes. But what would have also been helpful would have been if I had gotten a list of where all the breastfeeding um, spaces are throughout the city of New York to say this is something that um, is accessible to you and you could go to the borough president's office, you could go to Assemblymember Walter Mosley's or Councilmember Robert Cornegie's office. Has there been discussion, um, Dr. Easterling, in terms of how can we distribute that information more readily at the hospital so that moms have it right then and there? There, there has been discussion through, as I mentioned, our breastfeeding uh, hospital uh, collaborative, uh, how best we can make sure that that information is distributed. Uh, happy to follow up with your office to, to really think through what's the best way. Um, I know that some hospitals have it and some do not, and so we want to make sure that it is a standard of practice. I'd like that to be universal because I think that that's the first key to, it's changing societal norms. Because I even know when I came home and I was breastfeeding and sometimes people would see me in my community, there is that push to say like, you need to give that baby a bottle. Or, you never giving the baby a bottle? I gave the baby, I gave my baby a bottle with some formula and some cereal and he grew up big. Your baby's so small, you should have a big baby by now. So there's like this push to have a bigger baby and that push is, is, is pushed onto formula and cereal and other elements at a very early stage when you're still questioning what is the right answer for you. Um, when you talked about the disparities between women of color and white women, have you also broken that down more so by economics in the sense of is it more of an economic issue or is it really still a racial issue because many women of color may perhaps have to go right back to work and don't have the option or don't have paid family leave and have to go right back to work. So the idea of breastfeeding is just not possible. Um, so yes, uh, uh, you're, you're raising a lot of good points. Uh, I do think that the structural racism is still the number one issue uh, that exists both within the hospitals and also neighborhood environments. Uh, you know, specifically economic, and so that's also sort of a structural factor that also does play out. Uh, we do not have specific data that really speaks to each of these factors. Uh, we have done some uh, reports around neighborhood environmental factors, such as cultural norms, as you have mentioned, uh, because as, um, as more information is being readily available and taught, is that the, the child, the infant's stomach is the size of, size of a walnut, and, but then this overfeeding pattern is happening. So there's some cultural norms. There is the economic factor that also does play out about how people within communities of color and low-income communities have to return to work much sooner. Uh, but then also, as we had mentioned before, the structural factors and structural racism that exists within hospitals about how and who is getting what information and who is not getting other information, what resources are available, or what resources are not available. So we want to tease out all of it to understand you know, what is leading to those disparities and inequities that, that we see, mm -hmm. both within health, but also as we know that ultimately plays out um, to the dis to inequities overall within, say, one zip code versus another. Uh, I, so. I had the, the privilege of going to the Brooklyn Children's Museum and utilizing what seemed to be like a breastfeeding mini trailer to me, as I would describe it. What is the terminology you utilized for it? Uh, it's a lactation pod. A lactation pod, yes. okay. <laughs> I loved it and I utilized it, had never, would have never seen it had I not needed it. And so I think that that 
is a great answer to a lot of the issues that you brought up in terms of facilities. Can you answer me a few questions in terms of how much did the pod cost? Um, how big is it? And is this something, and how many spaces is it in currently? And could we utilize this for spaces throughout our city agencies that may not have the ability to put something or to build out a space structurally for a lactation room, but could have a pod that would service the same purpose as what we're trying to propose in the bills in terms of employees of 15 or more. But with a pod like this, it could even be even fewer employees because it doesn't take up that much space. Um, so to your first question, uh, the lactation pod was approximately $100,000. Uh, and so uh, it was an opportunity for the Department of Health to use some unspent funds uh, to um, implement and, uh, and uh, have lactation pods in various locations. And I listed that there were about five locations that we currently have across the city in each borough. Uh, so we can increase lactation spaces that are available for families, uh, particularly for mothers. Uh, and who paid for that? Department of Health and Mental Health. Department of Health yes. paid for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so the, if, is this an opportunity? I, I would say that the department uh, always supports the opportunity to expand spaces for lactation um, methods. Uh, I think that we would absolutely expand and, and want to support buildings and safe spaces where there are people because you want to have individuals to really support and manage those spaces. I think for the lactation pods, we're also, also uh, really supportive of expanding and figuring out how we can uh, provide those in more locations. So again, I think this is an opportunity to, opportunity to follow up with you, uh, but I think we want to offer the flexibility or is it in a building or could it also be in a more public space uh, in parks or other areas? So there, I think that there's a lot of flexibility there to, to see how we can make that happen. I want to turn it over to my colleagues because I know everyone has a lot of questions, but I just wanted to follow up on this point because I think it could address the issue that we were talking about in terms of a lack of space when we're talking about firehouses, uh, police precincts, schools, and many others. If we were to build more pods, do you think it's possible for the cost to come down and is there on the timeline a desire to um, implement or roll out more of the pods in the coming year? So we work with the vendor to purchase the pods. Uh, and so that would have to be a conversation with the vendor that we contracted through to purchase those pods about what the cost would be. Um, but again, I think the space, to your point, uh, is definitely an opportunity to be flexible about where we can have these lactation pods stationed uh, to increase the flexibility. I think it would be great if that could be a part of a great conversation that you all can have because I think that it addresses um, the, the question that you raised in terms of, I think you had said, um, which spaces can have lactation spaces and my question was more so how can we have lactation stations in every space possible versus which ones. I think everyone should be able to come up with a series of, well, if you can't do this, can you do this? And if you can't do this, can you do that? I think we need to have a tier of, of systems throughout each space to determine which is the best route for us to take. Uh, absolutely, full agreement with you. And, and um, yeah, we, we CGE and DOHMH would definitely like to work together on that. Wonderful, can I speak to that? thank you. Thank you so much, um, Majority Leader Cumbo. I'd like to turn it over now to the public advocate and give her a chance to ask some questions as well. Thank you. So I agree with Ms. Ebanks that um, there should be other stakeholders at the table. And so this um, more is a, maybe a question, I don't know, for the chairs or for perhaps the city agencies can answer this. Where is ACS and DSS today? Are, they test, are you testifying? Uh, no, but op available for question as needed. Okay. The only reason why I ask that is um, uh, out of respect for the administration and out of respect for this panel. Um, I think uh, clearly we need to hear from ACS and DSS who are responsible for child care in the city of New York. And so in the absence of um, uh, any, in the absence of um, questions with respect to real estate, I would like to know if we cannot, if we do not have the real estate because of the limitations in space, um, is, uh, is it possible that ACS and or DSS could provide vouchers for two municipal workers 
um, to um, seek child care in the city of New York. Um, and so uh, I wanted to ask that question and perhaps uh, at some point in time off the record, ACS and DCAS um, could Public respond advocate, to that question. You, uh, sure. You know, there are representatives from those agencies okay. and they can come up and you can ask them the question if you like. Yeah, because the question is what programs currently <laughs> exist in the city of New York um, for municipal workers to obtain childcare? And I don't know whether or not this panel is in a position to answer that question. Okay. Um, so and so I would the representatives think that ACS and DCA, DC, DSS is in a position. Thank what you. programs currently exist for municipal workers to obtain child care? Notwithstanding this wonderful panel, is there anyone in the audience who can answer that question? If the answer is we, you're not prepared to answer water, the question, you wanna we'll get back to me. That's good, um, too. And any other uh, city <clears throat> representatives from the city agencies, we can just pull up additional chairs. Thank you. Just, uh, you're going to be sworn in very quickly and then we'll continue. Hi. Uh, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Could you please state your name for the record before answering the public advocate's question? Thank you. Hi, my name is Mickey Ronan Grostern. I am an assistant commissioner at ACS in the uh, Division of Children and Families Wellbeing, and I can just speak to your question of eligibility. So the work that I do is actually I oversee the close to 400 child care centers that um, contain both child care and Head Start programs, and those are all eligibility-based programs. So we have to follow very strict guidelines. Um, <clears throat> as for the Head Start performance standards, it's for families earning up to 100% of the poverty line. What is and that in terms of um, income? Wages and what's the in, what's the income limitations on that? Excuse me. It also it it ranges on the uh, the federal uh, poverty guidelines are released every year. It really depends on the the number of people that live in that family, Got it. number of children, number of parents. It's et so for a family of four, what would be the income? What would be the maximum income allowable in order to get uh, affordable childcare in the city? Oh, I'm so I'm so have not looked. Is it at fair that to say recently, that it's around thirty thousand dollars? I'm sorry? Is it is fair to say that it's around thirty thousand um, dollars? it's possible. I, I really I have not looked at those guidelines in at okay. least a year or two, so okay. I apologize. Okay. Uh, for our child care centers, it's for families up to two hundred percent of the poverty line, but then there are other factors where they have to have um, they are looking for their other eligibility guidelines, they are enrolled in a college program or they're looking for work or so there are other limitations as well. So specifically for municipal workers, mm -hmm. there is no specific parameter for that that I'm aware of right now, but Got it. for us, it's all eligibility based. So let me just recap. So there, right now there is no specific program for municipal workers. Currently you based eligibility on federal guidelines. It depends upon the various factors. Are you in college? Are you working in school? Are you in school period? Are you working, looking for employment, et cetera? And, and income. And income. And is it fair to say that there's a waiting list? Uh, in, in many of our programs, yes. There's a waiting list. Mm -hmm. Do you know whether or not this administration is looking at a, a child care program specifically for municipal employees? I'm not aware. I'm okay. sorry. Thank you. I appreciate your answer. Okay. Um, the other guest who we know well. <laughs> Hi, Erin Drinkwater from the Department of Social Services. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, our programs would be eligibility-based um, and wouldn't uh, differ for those who are municipal employees or not. Okay, so um, thank you for that answer. So uh, recognizing, um, based upon DCAS's testimony, um, a, a number of the buildings, number of municipal employees work in state buildings, OCA, they're under the jurisdiction of a state agency, yes. To, um, there are leased buildings and you would like for the city council to remove the, um, the term leased buildings in the legislation. And the reason why that is is because of, because of cost or what's the basis for remo removing leased buildings in the legislation? The legislation currently says city controlled, which we are taking to mean leased. Right. Um, but I, I think it's if the decision is made by council to include lease spaces, that we need to include more parameters in, in that legislation as to what 
um, would be required for siting. So existing city controlled spaces probably would not, we could say off the bat, are really not feasible because we'd have to go and amend leases and that would almost be impossible to do in almost every case. It's very difficult enough to get daycare sites that are suitable. Um, so that's why we made that recommendation in Got the it. testimony. And um, so, again, just to recap so I can basically understand, um, you'd have to renegotiate leases, which um, obviously would be problematic, and two, the cost is prohibitive. Is, is that my understanding? I, I think it would just be better that if we did do uh, leased spaces that we would start with a new leased space. A new lease going forward, got it. And how long are the terms of the lease? Any idea for a, 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 a typical lease space? How long are the leases? It could be anything. We generally try to do at least 15 years to 20 years. Um, sometimes we're only able to get 10 years. Um, you know, for daycare especially, we like to do it as, as long as possible. It just depends on negotiations with that particular landlord. Got it. And is it possible to build out any of your underutilized land, for instance, your parking, municipal parking lots? Is it possible? Sure. I mean, w with the correct studies um, of whether those zoning permits in certain lots, whether zoning would have to be changed well, the or... city council can always change the zoning sure, for sure. that purpose. So, I, I, yeah, I think that would be part of what the study would be, whether to be build new, look at existing city spaces, or look at lease spaces. Um, so, mm, so, I would... I'm open to um, putting forth a resolution with respect to um, OCA, Office of Court Administration, state-owned buildings. I think that individuals and employees who work in OCA buildings and or individuals who have business before the courts should have um, an opportunity um, to have uh, child care available to them. I think that's really critically important, and that's a discussion that we will have with the state. Um, two, um, I understand your position with respect to lease property. I, I understand the terms of your lease m might be restrictive. Uh, and so I think at that point in time, I think it, it, we should consider possibly providing vouchers to municipal workers to obtain child care in the city of New York. Um, and I think um, uh, in here, working with the city council, and I believe working with ACS and DSS, we really need to look at some of these eligibility requirements, and we need to establish a program specifically for municipal workers in the city of New York. Um, I recognize that there are a number of challenges with, with, with respect to this, but I think um, women face a number of challenges in the city of New York, and we have to rise above and beyond these challenges and uh, provide child care. It's really critically important. I thank all of you for your work. Um, and I look forward to working with the members of the City Council to make this a reality for the countless number of families who desperately need child care mm -hmm. and who recognize that child care is a necessity in the City of New York. I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Public Advocate. I actually do just have one follow-up question um, from your bill um, to... Uh, oh, there's a lot of movement around. Come on back, Doctor. <laughs> Um, you mentioned concerns or complications with intro 87H, which apply to DOE and the jails, for example. Do you think that, um, you know, these lactation pods, which is now my favorite expression, uh, could be more easily used in those facilities? I would like to invite our colleagues from DOC to directly ans answer that question. Thank you. Um, if you could just uh, be sworn in and then state your name for the record, thank you. I do swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. My name is Dr. Nicole Adams. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Health Affairs for the New York City Department of Correction. So in respect, so I, I just want to say before I answer your question, I am so proud to be sitting here right now. It is so exciting. I have three babies and to listen to all this wonderful conversation about helping working mothers, it just, it does my heart good. So I'm so excited to sit here and I'm really excited. Like I wanted to say amen a couple of times when I was listening to you guys testifying, but yes, we are excited to explore the pod option. We've actually begun the process of trying to figure out how it's feasible. You know we have some infrastructure issues, but when we saw the legislation, we were so excited about how can we do this? What else can we do? 
And there definitely are some logistical and operational concerns, but we recognize that the lactation pods were an exciting option for us to consider. So excited about it, we started pricing it out, tried to figure out who'd be cleaning them, tried to figure out how do you maintain them in a way that's safe and being very security minded. So we really are exploring all of the operational and security concerns that kind of go with providing this to women, but we're, we're excited to, to cooperate and participate and do what we can. And I could probably keep talking about that a while, but I just, I guess I answered your question. So yes, we're looking into it. You could bring us all to tears. I mean, <laughs> that, could you someone explain what the hell is a pod? Like, I'm, I'm like, I'm clueless. <laughs> oh, Council Member Traeger, I was gonna call on you next. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, the lactation pod uh, is actually um, an enclosed space uh, and you can walk right into the space. It provides a chair, uh, seating area for you and other members of your family. You can bring your little child in uh, and actually in the, once you're in the space, it actually allows, have a nice lighting uh, and also just allows for the mother to either to pump and or breastfeed. Uh, and there's also sanitary items in there that will allow them to clean up as well. Uh, and so again, this was a, a one-time purchase for the Department of Health because we had unspent funds. Uh, and so working with that vendor, we were able to identify locations throughout the city where uh, these lactation pods uh, could be utilized. Just last question, Madam Chair, since she's talking, it's, a, it's portable? Uh, well, you cannot pick it up. It will take some a group of people oh, to permanent. move it. It's a permanent it, structure. But you can move it. No, you can move it. Right. But we just have to coordinate. That's what I would say with uh, with others. We have to coordinate to get about five or six other people to, to move it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yeah, there. For the record, let the record show that we're looking at lactation pods on our on our smartphones. <laughs> We're all for the pods. Um, Council Member Yeager, uh, I know you had some questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> also, let the record reflect that I think the baby approved of the, uh, of the <laughs> pod. I heard that. Um, yes, I believe that's, uh, for those of us who speak baby talk, uh, the parents in the room, yes, I believe that was amen. I have a question, uh, I have two questions for DCAS and for the Commission. Human rights. Uh, first, for the deputy commissioners of DCAS, um, and it's more of a comment than than I guess it'll have a period of time when you can answer if you'd like. W what the council has asked for in uh, Madam Public Advocate's bill, uh, intro 853, is for a feasibility study. And the concerns that you've brought in your testimony are, in my uh, very respectful opinion, better placed as part of the feasibility study. Um, if you know, I think you're selling yourself short, frankly. Uh, DCAS is a big agency. Uh, two years ago, this council, the predecessor uh, to this council, uh, uh, introduced a piece of legislation. The mayor signed it, a local law, to require a brand new program for school safety officers, um, for school safety agents in non-public schools. A argument could be made that that program would have been better suited for the Department of Education. Um, an argument could be made it would have been better suited for the police department, but uh, the wiser heads in this council and the administration prevailed and fell in your lap. And, uh, you know, the, the jury's still out, uh, but I think you're doing an okay job. So I think DCAS can handle something uh, and, and selling yourself short that this is not a program necessarily that, uh, that uh, should be undertaken or studied, uh, in the, you know, as, as the bill is currently written, I think is just uh, very, sh uh, uh, short-sighted way of looking at it, with due respect. Um, uh, and with respect to, and, and then I'll you know, let you uh, uh, give back as well as I give it. If I could comment Sure, on sure. So um, I had the good fortune of when I first got to DCAS not being in real estate and I worked on the school security bill and we, we did do it and we pulled a lot of heads together to try and make that work. And it, it was a very big challenge because we didn't have the expertise and we ourselves wondered why didn't this go to another agency with more expertise. So I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm saying if you um, looked at uh, efficiency and capacity, uh, some of the requirements are technical feasibility and anticipated costs, that there are agencies with a lot of expertise in that that we don't have. But, 
the Deputy Commissioner, that's the point I'm getting to, which is that as, as part of the feasibility study, we would be asking DCAS to come back with the answer, and that means calling on your colleagues and other agencies to help you give, do that feasibility study. It's not all on you. It's on you to lead the project. Uh, it's on you to write the report and give it back to the council, but it's not on you to do the actual work. If you think that ACS or the Department of Health or Health and Hospitals Corporation or uh, Department of Education, whatever it is, police department for their buildings and their facilities, fire department, whatever you think makes sense to get the feedback, you're the project leader. Lead the project and bring in those agencies to give you those answers and come back with the answer. But the point of, you know, ex uh, exempting a, a, a certain uh, amount of space, for example, with the least spaces. I mean, uh, you know, I was once a lawyer before I came here. Um, amending a lease is not a big deal. It's just not. You know, you go to the landlord and you say, we are a city agency, we pay you a bajillion dollars a year for this piece of property. We would like you to consider a midterm amendment to the lease that would allow us to put one room in that could be used for the following purposes. You okay with that? Because if not, when this lease is up, we're gonna take our business elsewhere. I think you'll find that most landlords will be okay with it. And so I'm just saying that don't sell yourself short. Uh, I think you can, you know, put your heads together, bring in your colleague agencies, and uh, try to get that happening. Okay. I mean, I, I, again, I think it's possible, and we, we could do it. I probable, think that probable. probable. There I we think go. I, you know, my, our question was why would council interject uh, DCAS as the agency to lead the study when the role that DCAS um, would play or it, its current mission would be smaller in terms of allocation of space? The the legislation Co calls council for members a pilot. pick your agency because right. they, they we trust you. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Um, but I even for the pilot program, that it would not really be feasible um, for, for DCAS to get that off the ground where we don't have that knowledge. So I would just ask that, you know, council consider that, leaving us as the lead agency in this um, to explore whether that would be the I, most appropriate one. Okay. Uh, fair enough. I mean, I'll just say in closing on that topic that uh, I think you've shown that you can get new uh, uh, projects and, you know, when the microphones aren't here, we can talk about why DCAS got the school safety project. Um, but uh, I think that you're selling yourself short, and I think that you can you can do this if if you bring in your sister agencies uh, to help out. I think you can get this done. I have a question for the uh, uh, Commission on Human Rights. Um, you indicated, and I'm sorry, I don't have your testimony, but I have notes. Uh, you indicated that you have a problem, or that the commission has a problem with uh, with the response time of five business days for a private employer. I believe. Uh, okay, what's the right amount of time? So the current law doesn't set a specific <clears throat> amount of time, but instead requires a dialogue between the employer and the employee, which would be, and then a fact, really fact specific analysis about what is needed for that employee at that time, and that also taking into consideration what the employer can offer. So it's not, it's similar to other disability accommodation, other accommodation analyses under An the discrimination law. In Four minutes. So we would we. You want it to be vague not and not want stated. To have, we think current law works. The standard that is laid that is, as it, it works now, an employer and employee engage in a cooperative dialogue. They figure out what's needed. It could be it could be that five days is way too long, and that would be a violation of the city human rights law. Two days could be too well, long. Well, uh, five days would not be uh, too long in a violation of the city human rights law if this council legislates five days. Uh, it, to be very clear. It would create dueling standards, actually, no, and it, it would be... It would say five days for, for a lactation space. Uh, it's, it's not a dueling standards. Again. Often a lactation space-related reasonable accommodation claim could be intertwined with other pregnancy accommodation-related claims, and it, would, it could really cause some confusion, and in fact, even in one situation... Which is what we're trying to avoid with, with... We don't want confusion, so what we've done here... Uh, in a very wise bill uh, by four of my colleagues, three of whom are women, um, some of whom are parents, uh, they, they came up with a deadline, five days. It doesn't mean that the employer can't give an answer in a day, and an employer who chooses to give an answer in a day will get hosannas, but uh, maybe an employer won't. But five days is the deadline, it's the top, it's don't exceed five days. Um, what, what you're proposing is a vagueness um, you know, those, those who write laws and those who enforce laws know that we want, uh, we want certainty in the law. We want employers to know that if they don't answer within a certain period of time, what's that period of time? Well, look, these fine council members 
said five days and the mayor signed the bill. That's wonderful, so it's five days it is. And the point of that is to avoid what you've described as the current process, a back and forth and then a flip of a coin. The Human Rights Commission says, well, for that employer, a day was too long. For that employer, six weeks was too long. This way we're saying five days is the limit. It can't go to five days in one hour. It's five days. I think our primary concern is that it could be interpreted to limit current protections, that actually instead of increased protections, this could make employers less responsive. And so we, look, we would very much like to look for work with council to create a solution that would provide more clarity and actually expand protections rather than well, limit what, what we have. What would the answer be then? We would, I mean, if there is, it would be hard for me to speculate right now about how to fit a limit within the undue hardship standard, which is something that applies to all accommodations under the city human rights law, disability, religion, domestic violence, and pregnancy. So we would very much like to sit down and work out a solution if that's, if there is going to be a hard stop Okay. Maybe the, some language we're all, we're all could be. Here now. Yeah, yeah, maybe some language could be indicated that that is an employer may, must respond more quickly under certain certain circumstances. Something that helps the employer and the employee understand that it's not sit and wait for five days if you have a lactation space available and a currently lactating employee. Um, but that that would be the deadline as you articulated. I think if the if the statute expressly. If the proposal expressly uh, connected to the existing standard and then uh, increased the protection, I think that would be, that's something that we could Well, I look forward to uh, hearing back from you on, on what the limit should be. Yeah, we can definitely. Be. Okay, thank you very back. much, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Council Member. Council Member Traeger. So in the uh, opening statement, uh, I'm just gonna repeat what was stated. Uh, the administration supports the intent of intro 380 in DCAS currently has in place a contract for diapers. This contract is available to all city agencies, but unfortunately, procurement rules do not allow for DCAS to make these goods directly available to non-government entities. So I, I would just need some further clarity on this. Um, so is it correct to say that DCAS does have diapers to distribute? I do you swear or affirm, tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Is the mic? The mic is not on. Thank you. I'm Mercita Eiberg, Deputy Commissioner for Citywide Procurement at DCAS. So yes, we do have contracts in place. Uh, currently, only city agencies can procure off those contracts. So for example, uh, a daycare center could not procure directly from our contracts or order directly from our contracts. However, ACS can. So it says here that procurement rules do not allow for DCAS to make these goods directly available to non-government entities. Um, which procurement rules? So our citywide contracts are only made available to all city agencies. It's the way that the structure is set up. But are, is, this, is this city code? Is this a statute? Is this a regulation? Is this guidance? Can you speak to what level rule this is? Yeah, I believe it's much more technical than that. So in order for an aid or anyone to uh, procure directly from our contracts, you'd have to have a payment mechanism in place and that's through the city's financial management system. And so right now only city agencies are able to access and use that system. But just so I'm clear, have nonprofits requested diapers from the city administration to help families in need? So those are requ requests would come directly to city agencies, not to DCAS. Um, so I, don't, I can't speak on behalf of the other city agencies, but that would probably be through ACS, DSS, as, you know, so. I, I just want clarity whether or not we have turned away any family in need of diapers because of a bureaucratic process that I'm not even clear about right now as far as whether this is law or this is simply just someone's interpretation of a bureaucratic regulation or rule or guidance because there's a difference between a law and a regulation and guidance. Absolutely. So are we dealing with law or are we dealing with just a regulation or guidance? So I'm going to open it up to um, the other um, agencies that would actually um, answer those requests. But again, it's, it's, it's a bit more sort of mechanical than that. Um, and so right now, all city agencies 
uh, there's about 100 of them, uh, and authorities and departments are able to procure diapers through our contracts. So I don't know if anybody else wants I, to. Well, I was just going to add to that. I, it, I think it's uh, what we're recommending is that the, the language and the legislation be changed because just the way it works isn't that they would come to DCAS because we don't run those programs. So there needs to be a program in place which would be run by the agencies who then could deliver that good. It's really not a matter of you know trying to get around something and making it bureaucratically difficult. It's just that there's an agency that serves that need. It isn't DCAS. DCAS's uh, service is to bribe provide the procurement to make the contract vehicle available to the agency. Yeah, I mean, there's a willingness on our part, on my part, to make the language as, as simple as easy for families to get diapers. What, what I'm just trying to understand is that this is the first I'm, I'm reading about procurement rules that do not allow for this to happen right now, and I'm just trying to get clarity. Is that the discretion of a commissioner, or is, are you bound by some law? So I, I also want to add um, uh, that you, know, you cited this earlier, the feminine hygiene law. So th that law is written the same way that we're sort of recommending that these changes uh, as well, right? So that there, it, it directly uh, indicates that the city agencies are procuring these items on behalf of other entities. Um, and to answer your direct question, I believe that it has, it's much more mechanical, much more technical than that, um, but we can absolutely follow up with the exact reference for you. Okay, and to be clear, the administration supports the legislation, making sure the language is clear as possible, and to make it as easier as possible for families to obtain the diapers. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay, I, I will stop here. I'm just saying that I was very concerned that uh, a, you know, a single mom who came into my office who was in desperate need of housing um, was going through the shelter system had very a very difficult time obtaining basic needs for her child. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, it, it really, it, it hit uh, the heart of my staffer, it hit the heart, it hit my heart when, when we heard this because diapers, I think we'd all agree, are basic necessities, these are not luxury items. And I, I don't know why it's difficult to get diapers into the hands of, of families that, that, that need them. But anything we can do to make this process as easy as possible, and um, again, and I would just ask, because passing this will take some time, hopefully not a lot of time, but will take some time, I'm just asking the commissioners and the administration to review your current policy now and to see if there's anything you can do within your discretion now to make this process easier to get diapers in into the hands of families that, that need them. And I thank the chair yes. for, for her time. Thank you so much. And, oh, do you want to add something, please? Um, the committee council will just swear you in very quickly. Bless you. Raise right hand. Do you swear firm, tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. Hi, my name's Elizabeth Dank. I'm the Deputy Commissioner and General Counsel at the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence. So I just wanted to give an example in the Family Justice Centers were alluded to in the legislation. Um, so the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence operates the New York City Family Justice Centers. And at the FJCs, um, we provide diapers and other practical needs to clients using city um, procurement contracts in order to do that. So that's one example of how, um, even though what DCAS was saying about how contracted providers are not able to access those without working through the programs they're working with, we're able to provide those um, diapers through the city's procurement. Right, and I think you've just kind of made my point that you found a way to make it happen. I am just right. want, I want that to happen across the board uniformly across all city government to yes. make this process easier for families. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member um, Traeger, and uh, I think that's it for this panel. Thank you. And we're just going to hear from DSS one more time. Rotating Thank chairs. Erin Drinkwater again, DSS. I wanted to respond in regards to our domestic violence shelters and uh, the family with children shelters run by uh, Department of Homeless Services. Um, we will be having a hearing on Thursday about model budgets, but one of the things that the model budget process addressed was uh, the client supplies. Uh, diapers are provided both in domestic violence shelters currently and in family with children shelter currently as part of the shelter pantries. 
Um, so I wanted to let you know that they are currently available. If there's any information on this particular client, please, we can talk afterwards and, and follow up, uh, but wanted to provide that information uh, to the committee. Thank you so much, it's really helpful. You just gave me an idea. Um, okay, thank you so much, this panel. Really appreciate all your thoughtful insight and um, answers to our question. Next, I'm calling up, um, representing the New York City Campaign Finance Board, Amy Loprest and anyone else that she would like to bring up with her. But uh, again, our next panel will be from the New York City Campaign Finance Board. How you doing? All right, you have any comments? Great. And do you have testimony that you want to share? It's on its way. Okay. Terrific. I'm going to ask committee counsel to swear you in. Do you swear or affirm, tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth before these, in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. If you could just introduce yourself and your title for the record. Thank you. So okay. good to see you, by the way. Um, good afternoon, Chair Cabrera, uh, Chair Rosenthal, members of the Committees on Governmental Operations and the Committee on Women. My name is Amy Loprest. I'm the Executive Director of the New York City Campaign Finance Board. Thank you for the invitation to provide testimony on Intro 899, which would permit campaign funds to be used for certain child care costs for children under 13 years of age for which the candidate is the primary caregiver. For over 30 years, the city's public matching funds program, which we administer, has opened the door for aspiring office holders of all backgrounds to run competitive campaigns. We are supportive of efforts for removing the barriers that keep qualified New Yorkers from seeking elected office. As we consider the legislation, we have identified some administrative and practical concerns. Currently under the Campaign Finance Act, Section 702.21b, uh, childcare costs are clearly included among expenditures that are not in furtherance of a political campaign for elective office. The bill would amend the act to allow the expenditure of campaign funds on child care costs that would not exist but for the campaign or campaign activities. Such expenditures would not be an allowable use of public funds. To ensure the legislation fulfills its intent, we have identified some recommendations for further review. We would recommend the bill clarify that permitted campaign expenditures pertain, pertain specifically to child care services, such as a qualified caregiver or daycare. One model is the definition of eligible expenses under the Dependent Care Assistance Program, or DCAP, that's av available to city employees. Under DCAP, pre-tax funds can be used to pay for employment-related dependent care expenses performed within or outside the home while a city employee or the employee's spouse is at work or attending school full-time. A qualifying caregiver is someone who is not a dependent spouse or the spouse's child. Paying a family member for child care expenses presents a unique issue. The bill does not explicitly carve out as impermissible payments to family member for child care arrangements. However, 3-702-21A does not extend the presumption that the enumerated expenditures are in furtherance of the campaign to payments made to candidates as spouse, domestic partner, child, parent, or sibling. If the council was to use the DCAP definition for child care services, dependents, spouses, and spouses' children would not be covered, but considerations would have to be made for other family members, such as grandparents or siblings. As drafted, the bill would require candidates to fill out an approved statement of child care need with the board, which the board could approve in whole or part or deny. We agree candidates should be required to make a showing that expenditures, quote, would not exist but for the campaign, end quote, and as such are permissible campaign expenditures. However, the statement, if approved, should certify only that the expenses exist solely because of the campaign. 
It should not constitute a pre-approval of individual child care expenditures, which would still be subject to the post-election audit review, as are all other types of expenditures. The board anticipates promulgating rules to clarify the standard and how candidates will be able to satisfy it. An open, transparent rulemaking process in consultation with potentially affected stakeholders will help ensure the board can develop guidelines that are both practical and fair. While child care costs would not be qualified expense under the legislation, they would be subject to the spending limit, which would help limit the overall amount that candidates spend on child care costs through their campaign. However, the bill does not specify if campaign funds for child care costs can be spent in the out years or post-election. It is likely that the need is greatest in the year of the election, and we recommend that expenditures on child care costs be permissible only in the year of the election. With regards to disclosure around the issue of child care expenses, expenses, there must be a balance between ensuring proper documentation is maintained and submitted to the board and protecting children's information from disclosure. The board is sensitive to these concerns and we believe they can be addressed through the rulemaking process, but we thought it was important to raise them here. We hope you'll take these concerns into consideration. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your testimony. Um, I, I do think this is a tricky issue, and I respect that and understand it wholeheartedly. I do have to say, um, having lived through uh, two elections, I, I, I think it would be a, um, a penalty to, to the child, um, the caretaker, if uh, they would be subject still to the spending cap, um, just knowing in my mind's eye how that money gets spent, um, having to add on, I, I'm not sure where I would take away, having spent um, up to the cap in my two campaigns, I don't quite know what I could give up spending money on in, uh, in order to cover those costs. So I respect the fact that, you respect the fact that it's a complicated, tricky issue. Um, so thank you for that. Do any of my colleagues have questions? Yes, Councilmember Cumbo. Thank you. So I want to piggyback on Councilmember Rosenthal in terms of um, gaining clarity on if the money spent on child care would count towards your cap. You're saying yes? Well, I mean, the way the law is written, that these would be campaign-related expenses, and all campaign-related expenses apply to the spending cap. Now, there are certain very narrow exceptions, but, but generally. It would make sense maybe if, like, you had a 13-year-old, and your 13-year-old went to school Monday through Friday, and they got out at 5, 6 o'clock for after school, and maybe from 6 to 9, you would need that type of, and so you might utilize your funds for that. But if you have a newborn, and let's say you're campaigning and the baby's three months old, um, such as was in my case, child care in the Fort Greene Clinton Hill area is about $2,000 a month. So if you were, and that's on the very low end and you're not at a great child care space and it's, it's not the creme de la creme, there's no waiting list for the $2,000 a month child care space. So you, what you're stating is that that $2,000 a month would go towards your cap. Yes, because these are to be only expenses that you wouldn't have had to have other except for running for office. So, you know, if you had been working before, you would have had child care expenses beforehand. Um, but this, this law is to provide for people to be able to spend campaign money on child care costs that would not exist but for your running for office. That's, and that's my understanding of the intended purpose of the law. So it's not just to allow campaign funds to be spent for childcare costs in general. It's really that very narrow um, type of expenses that wouldn't exist but for your running for office. And I, we, of course, do understand that childcare costs are significant. I mean, the, you're, you're right. The, the number you're citing is probably a low number. Right. I don't understand the nuance that you're stating. Um, and, and that's you're saying like if you had a job, let's say 
I'm a city council member, so I had a job before, and then I ran for office. My baby was born in August. My primary was in September. My general election was in November. So if I wanted to use my expenses for child care, what are you stating should happen in that case? Um, I, I think that, that actually is probably the perfect example of the child care cancer expenses that wouldn't occur but for the campaigning. You were already campaigning and you had a baby and you therefore you needed to have child care expenses to care for the baby while you continued to campaign. Um, that was exactly the, the fact pattern that was presented to the Federal Election Commission upon which this legislation is based, is a candidate who had a baby while she was campaigning um, and then wanted the FEC to allow her to use campaign funds to pay for childcare expenses because now she had childcare expenses that she, she couldn't stay home and take care of the baby because she was campaigning. It, your, your situation is exactly analogous to the situation that was presented to the Federal Election Commission. Um, of course, under federal law, there are no spending caps. And so that, you know, so that wasn't an issue for the Federal Election Commission. I still don't understand it, but what I do understand is that my takeaway would be it's better not to use your campaign expenses for child care expenses if you've just had a baby. That's my takeaway. Would you say that's the right takeaway? I mean, I think that If that's you're running an intelligent election. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things that we had uh, talked about is that there's a lot of, I mean, that's one of the issues, is that there's a lot of devil in the details in here of like how, the de how things are defined. And I think that one of our, that's what I said in my testimony, is that one of the takeaways from for our point of view, is that because of the spending cap, there would be necessarily people would be constrained in the amount of money that they would spend on childcare, um, just as you suggest. Because this piece of legislation, it sounds good, it's a great hashtag, it makes the news media, but that devil in the detail is where this could just be a good sounding we're trying to make it better for women to run for office. You have this option, but if you're really an intelligent woman running for office, you won't take it. But if you're not so intelligent, you would take it, and you take out $2,000, $2,500 a month for your child care, and then it'll add up towards your spending cap. When in a real election, you don't want to feed anybody. You don't want to give anybody a Metro card. You, don't, you got you know, young people working with you. It's late at night. Sorry. You shouldn't have stayed out so late door knocking with me. You know, you've got to start making those hard decisions because running an election with the caps that you have are very specific. So it really wouldn't, in theory, it really, maybe somebody that's running like one of those kinds of, um, I'm just running for the sake of running to get my name out there, maybe those types of people could use it. But somebody that's trying to run and win wouldn't use it. And in addition to that, um, a woman who's deciding to run for the very first time, you don't, if you're running a competitive election, you're not working either. So my election in 2013, I had to discontinue my job for a whole entire year to run because of the aggressive nature of the other candidates who had also stopped working as well. So I had five candidates, two were men who continued their full-time jobs, three were women, we finished in the top first, second, and third place, but that demonstrates you had to quit your job in order to run for office. So I, I just want to say it would be, it would be disingenuous to pass this bill if we didn't have the ability for it not to count against the cap in a meaningful way. So that that's just kind of one of the challenges that I have with that. Um, and I definitely don't think that it should be only for the year of the election because when I ran in 2013, um, when I ran in 2013, I had, to be, I had to stop working the year before. So I believe it should be not just for the year that you're running, it should be for the year prior to the year that you're running. So when let's say it's 2021, you should be able to, if this is utilized the right way, utilize all of 2020 and all of 2021 
to be able to run for your campaign and, and to utilize this particular provision. It shouldn't just be for the year because if you're just doing it for the year, you're not really running a really competitive campaign. I mean, some people can if they have certain types of name recognition, but if you're trying to get your name out there, you need more than a year to do that. Councilmember Yeager. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good afternoon, Madam Director. The administrative code is uh, the basis for what constitutes an exempt expenditure, correct, right? The CFB doesn't actually make the rules about what's exempt and what's not exempt. No, the, the, the act. Uh, Campaign Finance Act. Yes. So my, my comment to my colleague, uh, Madam Majority Leader, is if you were to amend this law to require that these expenditures be exempt from the spending cap, I would support that, and I think the sponsor of this bill should support that, um, and I think that would be a wise way to get around uh, the several conundra that you pointed out uh, in this bill, because this is an important bill. And what we're trying to do here, uh, I think the colleagues who uh, proposed this legislation, is to mirror what the FEC did, and I don't think this bill actually does that. And I'm going to point out some ways that I think this bill is not actually doing what the FEC just did. Uh, first of all, just uh, to correct the record, uh, I'm sure this was not intentional, uh, the candidate in the FEC matter did not have a baby during the campaign already had three children, gave up her income so that she can engage uh, in campaigning, and the FEC decision also, uh, the FEC opinion also referenced a prior case uh, from two decades ago where it was the candidate's wife who was the primary caregiver, and because she was campaigning, uh, in that case, the FEC allowed it. And what the FEC said now, I'm, I'm not smarter than you, I just have it in writing. Um, uh, the FEC said that uh, in, this in this opinion, any person involved in any specific transaction or activity which is indistinguishable in all its material aspects from the transaction or activity with respect to which this advisory opinion is rendered may rely on this advisory opinion. Now that's our lawyers speak for this is binding. So having said that, um, this bill would require that a uh, caregiver who needs to uh, expend sums from the campaign or desires to expend sums from his or her campaign in order to care for a child so that the caregiver who is a candidate can go out and campaign would have to ask you for permission. That's yes no? the way the law is drafted. Correct. Currently, yes. Okay. So uh, do you think that's right? Um, I think there's, I mean, as I pointed out, there are some administrative issues with that. I mean, in particular, the definition of what you know, what uh, is means to be but for campaigning to have cam uh, child care expenses. Also, the idea of what is that, when people file that statement, what does that mean as far as all your expenses going forward? Or does that mean that any expense that you say is child care related is uh, appropriate? Or is that statement really just saying, yes, we're certifying that you've made the demonstration that you didn't have these expenses but for the campaign. So if the candidate, under this bill, your interpretation as we sit here, is if the candidate certifies to the board that the candidate's expenditures are but for uh, his or her status as a candidate would not exist, that, is, that statement would be subject to a review by the CFB, at which the CFB can say no, um, at which point the candidate could then submit additional statements if denied or if a change in need occurs. So if the CFB says no, the candidate can come back and beg again. And my question is, wouldn't it be better if the candidate simply made an affirmative statement under oath saying, dear CFB, want to let you know I have a child, but for my campaign status as a candidate, I would not have to incur these expenses, but now that I'm a candidate and I have to go out to the what's it called Civic Association and the such and such precinct council and have to have fundraisers, not just in the year before the campaign, but the first and second and third year before the campaign and the year before the campaign. Thank you very much, CFB. Please paste this information in my file. And then your job is done. You don't have to say yes. You don't get to say no and the candidate gets to make the expenditures in accordance with the sworn statement. And in the very, very rare case where a candidate has lied under oath and you so discover, refer it to the appropriate prosecutor. But the CFB doesn't get to say yes or no. Would that be a better way to go? 
I don't have to think about it. I think that that is, I mean, it's clear. I mean, that's a clear statement. Um, uh, again, it's, it's more like the, you know, other provisions of the law, like the statement of need, um, you know, that, which it, I guess that requires us to demonstrate, you know, that you met one of those criteria. And it's like the original, the way the statement of need was before it was amended. Right. So um, the statement yeah. of need actually has set forth criteria, which the candidate checks off a number of boxes and said, because I had to do a statement of need. I was outspent three to one. I had to do a statement of need um, uh, because... But for that, even though my, can't, my opponent could spend three times what I was for, for, or close to four times, I was still held down to a lower limit. I had to come and beg for permission. But there are clear criteria on what constitutes statement of need. It's not discretionary by the CFB. You don't get to say no because I meet the criteria. Guy had a famous last name. His father held office. I get to come in with a statement of need. So, but in the case of child care, that's discretionary. You can say, well, Council member Combo, she's a full-time council member right now. She doesn't need to take off and spend money on hiring somebody to take care of her child. But we all know, we know her. We know that she had a child in the middle of a campaign. She had a heated primary. She had, somebody had to watch that baby, otherwise she couldn't go out and campaign. It's not a secret that we don't get paid here by the hour. If I don't show up to work for six months, I still get a check. It's, but, so I could have taken off, she, she, well, I wasn't in the council. She could have taken off from her job to go campaign. We're allowed to do that. We are elected officials. We're not the separate description of public servants, although we are public servants. It's a whole different <laughs> distinction in the charter. So the point is that she needed to go and do that, but she would have to beg you for permission. And if you said, well, you know, you know you're, you, you got a job. You, if you want to go do your job, you have to get child care. So therefore, as a candidate, you know, that's on you. Should a candidate have to go through that um, whether it's the year of the campaign, whether it's August of the primary, or whether it's a year and a half before, and the candidate says, you know, normally I don't have this issue, but it happens to be that I have a fundraiser tonight, and it runs from six to nine, and I don't have anybody to watch my child. I need to hire a babysitter to do so. Should that be subject to a check off yes or no by the CFB? I, I mean, again, I, we didn't write this the way the legislation is written now. Um, it's not our, our recommendation, and so we'd be happy to work with the council to make it closer to what you're describing. Did you participate at all with the city council and suggest any language prior to today's hearing in the I mean, legislation? I think we talked to the, the, the uh, but we didn't suggest any particular was, language. Was any of your suggestions and some of the concerns that you've raised prior to today incorporated in the final version of the bill that you're seeing in front of you today? I'm not sure. I mean, Okay, just want to make sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess what what, what happened is we we talked to them and they they said that we're going to work in, uh, in on drafting new language in the future. So I don't think it's it's been incorporated yet. But I think it, you know there's certainly not but an, an unwillingness to work. So on if we were to propose a revision to this bill and if the if the A version of this bill were to come out and it were to remove from the legislation the portion thereof that requires that the candidate receive your approval prior to making those expenditures or subsequent thereto. Would you support that as being a much cleaner way? This way, this candidate, in my version of it, the candidate would simply submit a sworn statement, dear campaign finance board, I hereby affirm under the penalty of perjury or I am duly sworn as the case may be that I would, that I have these following expenditures related to the care of my child. Um, uh, and I anticipate they will be whatever, or I don't anticipate they will be whatever, whatever the case may be. Send off the statement to the CFB and call it a day. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, I think it makes it, it, it more important to define what we're talking about as child care services, especially as if we're talking about making them exempt from the spending limit um, and, and also making, you know, this preemptive statement. One, just to do what you, exactly you're saying is to make it clearer and more less discretionary, you know, to make a narrow, you know, the child care expenses are, you know, as we suggest in here, kind of following the guidelines of this is a federal program, this deferred, uh, the dependent care assistance program, you know, that you really, that those expenses are limited to child care services for a qualified caregiver or a daycare, like the people that actually take care of your child, not, you know, I mean, there are, as 
Uh, Councilmember Cumbo knows, as you know, <laughs> there are a lot of expenses related to raising a ch you know, child care expenses could be a very expansive. Well, I don't uh, think anybody's different. talking about diapers yeah. or, or baby formula. In no, this and bill. I think that that's the And I don't think the, the CFE law. would think yeah. that. And, and surely, even if this bill wasn't at all clarified, if a candidate went out and bought diapers on the campaign dime, that candidate, I think, would face serious problems, not just with you, but with the prosecutors. So I don't think that that's a concern that's a legitimate concern, necessarily, of a candidate going out there because this bill is perhaps not completely artfully drawn, um, that uh, the, nothing personal, Brad, <laughs> I love you, um, that uh, a candidate would go out there and do childcare costs and say, well, I, you know, I've, I've taken my kid to great adventures. That's a child care cost. Um, obviously, we're talking, about, we're talking about legitimate care costs. Mm -hmm. And my, my suggestion would be that we take the FEC approach, which is that this, the, the, the reasonable reliance on the three-page FEC opinion, uh, if a candidate says that, you know, I'm the primary caretaker or my spouse or partner or what have you is the primary caretaker and together we are involved in this campaign and as such we have this issue, um, and just to be clear, my child's 16 years old, I don't have this issue, I'm not looking to benefit from this law in any way uh, for now. Um, but uh, that reliance, that reasonable reliance on a clear set of standards that you can put out, because you can even design the form, the affidavit form, and I would say it should be an affidavit, sworn statement, but then that's it. No, no, uh, no discretion, uh, no checking off, no yes or no, no July, 15th at the time that a candidate is filing his or her petitions, his or her disclosure statement, his or her COIB disclosures, and wants to submit this statement to you, and all of a sudden the CFB is well like, no, no, you can't pay it on that. And the, C and the candidate has to go back with another set of paperwork and say, well, look, I have these expenses and paying it to mom and pop's daycare incorporated, it's legit, and no, 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 that's not good enough. You need to get it again. It needs to be on pink paper this time. It needs to be copied the right way, 300 uh, MBP, whatever it's called with the, with the dots and the scanning. I mean, you guys have a lot of rules about things you have to do. And if you don't do it a certain way, you get a sledgehammer over the head. What I want to make sure is that that doesn't happen to a person 60 days prior to an election. And so Council Member Cumbo, who doesn't get to run again for uh, this body, but God willing gets to run for something one day and will at that point have a child who's two or three years old, and it, I anticipate will also have a child care costs and should be able to avail herself of of a very wisely uh, thought of legislation without having to beg for relief. I mean, yes, I mean, we've already. Yes, we've already okay, <laughs> good. We're on the same page, perfect. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, thank you. Can I just make a point of clarity? Please. So in my situation also, when I had my son in August in my election in September, and then my general in November, technically, I should have been on uh, maternity leave but I couldn't have maternity leave because I had to run for office, which if this bill were written and, and passed in a law, then that sort of dynamic should be exactly the quintessential of who needs childcare and if it's permissible. And so I think that the nuances that you're bringing up is everybody has such a different situation that I think it's really on the, the owner, the ownership should be on the candidate in terms of identifying what their need is going to be versus the CFB, because you could have the approach of, well, you already have a job, so you don't need childcare, whereas my position would be, I'm on maternity leave, and if not for this election, I would be at home bonding and learning how to be a mom and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I also don't have children, so it would be difficult for me to qualify for this. <laughs> Great, I uh, really appreciate um, Councilmember Yeager, your expertise on the Campaign Finance Board is um, Im very impressive, very impressive and very helpful to the council. Um, I appreciate your bringing up the idea to switch that to, the, to I affirm, just in the same way we say, I affirm we're gonna spend the money appropriately. Um, so, so I really do appreciate it. I would, I, my, t you know, my two cents would be to do that, but also to make it um, um, something that's above and beyond uh, what the campaign, the public money that's provided through the um, campaign finance board, that there should be public money allotted uh, for this as well 
because again, as we were discussing with this entire package of bills, taking down the hurdles for um, you know women or uh, men who care for their children, primarily um, taking down all barriers for them to, in this case, run for office. And um, you know, I'm not sure that we should be expected to have to raise more money from our donors who want us to run for office. Um, uh, I, 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 my two cents is it would come out of the public purse. But regardless, thank you very much for coming here and testifying today. Thank we you. really do appreciate uh, your thoughts on this. I'm going to call up the next panel. Um, and unfortunately, I think we've lost a few members of the public because this hearing has gone on for a while. Um, so we lost, I know, Felice Farber from the uh, General Contractors Association. We're about to leave, lose our majority leader, who is a rock star and mother. And yeah. Um, and uh, we also lost uh, one of my favorite doulas. Um, oh, but we have a replacement doula. OK. Um, actually, that's great. And you can come up in. in Oh, I think you're on the next panel. That's right. We're going to get to you really fast. Uh, we have a representative from Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer's office, um, Shula Warren Puder, and Audrey Sims from the National Diaper Bank Network, who's a volunteer, Alyssa Allison Weir from the National Diaper Bank Network, and um, Chanel Portia Albert, who I think had to leave, but do you want to go in her place? That's fine. Come on up, and you'll just introduce yourselves. All right, if I could ask the Sergeant in Arms, we're going to put a three minute clock only because we have a deadline for this room. Um, if everyone could, um, if we could start with you, Miss. Warren, and if you do introduce yourself for the record. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. My name is Shulamit Warren Puder. I'm the policy director for Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. And thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is not Gail Brewer, but I am speaking on behalf of her, and she's the Manhattan Borough President. I would like to thank Chairs Rosenthal and Cabrera, as well as the members of both committees, for the opportunity to testify in support of Intro 380 in relation to the provision of diapers. For the past two winters, my office has led a diaper drive in partnership with the Food Bank and Girl Scouts. Truly, this is an unusual addition to the city's many holiday season donation drives, but fills a real need, and we are proud to have distributed nearly 25,000 diapers only this year at emergency food providers throughout the borough. Supplying diapers for free at these food bank partners helps relieve a major burden on parents and children. As we all know and has been discussed extensively throughout this hearing, these families often rely on child care services that require them to supply disposable diapers and wipes for their children. Without diapers, low-income working parents who use child care services can't go to work or school because the services require each parent to supply diapers, not to mention yet again wipes, uh, for their children. I support Intro 380 and commend its primary sponsors, Council Members Traeger, Ampri Samuel, Rosenthal, Cumbo, Levin, and Reynoso. Yesterday, the Center for New York City Affairs released a brief in trends that are reshaping New York's changing world of child care. It cites licensed group family child care as the fastest growing child care capacity for the city's infants and toddlers. Could these sites be included in the legislation? I would also like to suggest this bill be expanded to include emergency food providers that serve families and have the capacity for distribution. Low-income working parents may receive SNAP and WIC, which they cannot use to purchase diapers and wipes, yet may not live in homeless shelters or have their children placed in the eligible child care centers. At the beginning of this month, my office conducted a study in order to determine whether the soup kitchens and food pantries across Manhattan were in need of diapers. For the sites that currently distribute diapers, they depend on donations that are unreliable. Out of the 68 soup kitchens and food pantries that we spoke with, 35, or around 52% of the programs, expressed a strong desire for a regular supply of diapers. While not all soup kitchens and food pantries have a client base or capacity for diaper distribution, it would be wrong to turn a blind eye on the programs for which a supply of diapers is just as imperative as food support, especially as their client families are challenged with this additional financial strain on households with very limited resources. 
sites like the Hope Lions Diaper Distribution Program in the Bronx, established by Executive Director Maria Cintron, should be reviewed and recommended as a best practice, and I'm sure as the colleagues who are on this panel as well. I want to thank the sponsors again for trying to ease the burden on low income and working families in our city. Thank you for the time. Hi, my name is Audrey Sims. I am a volunteer with the National Diaper Bank Network and I live here in New York City. I would like to thank the council so much for giving me the opportunity to testify on this issue that's very close to my heart. Um, I have been on, in a volunteer- like We're restarting the clock for you. Oh, sorry. Okay. Keep going, you're fine. Um, I've been volunteering for the National Diaper Bank Network, first for the Good Plus Foundation, which is a New York City diaper and baby supply um, foundation, and then for the larger National Diaper Bank Network in a lobbying capacity for about two years. And I started out um, just going around in my neighborhood and collecting open packets of diapers that people didn't need anymore. Um, and from there, it really grew into a passion. And what I'd like, what I kind of want to point out from my perspective as a kind of civilian volunteer is the interest and uh, uniquely compelling interest that New Yorkers have in this issue. Parents from all over the city um, have messaged me to come get diapers and say, I can't believe this is such an, you know, such a need. And everyone is always surprised that diapers aren't covered under any programs. Because any parent, as any parent knows, you really can't do anything without diapers. Um, and so over the past two years, through both my own just collections with my daughter walking around in our stroller, putting them under the bottom, and having people drop them off, and I've been able to participate in a few diaper drives with other organizations. Um, I've estimated about 25,000 diapers just from people who have been interested in this cause. And um, I think that the, after the donation piece, the next question is always what more can we do um, from these concerned citizens? And I think uh, Council Member Trigger's bill does an excellent job addressing this issue, supplementing the supply that New Yorkers have um, been so eager to donate. As um, Gail Brewer's office mentioned, sometimes the supply is very um, erratic or I often collect like lots and lots of little tiny diapers and not as many big diapers um, because you go through the smaller sizes very quickly and then the bigger ones, but you have the more need for. I've also heard many stories about, you know, kids going through trauma and regressing. So that's an extra expense that you weren't counting on necessarily. There's so, diaper need touches on so many issues in the spectrum, wider spectrum of poverty and is, I feel, a linchpin for addressing these issues in an effective and tangible, concrete way. Um, so I'm very honored to be able to support this bill, and I hope that the council will take it further and hopefully provide New York with the, um, the dignity that the most vulnerable citizens deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Um, greetings, everyone. My name is Jen. Hello. Okay, yeah. Greetings, everyone. My name is Berenice Kernazan. Um, I am here to give the testimony of Chanel Portia Albert, who is the executive director of Ancient Song Dual Services. Um, okay. So good afternoon to all, and give thanks for joining us today to support the movement towards black justice, or towards justice in black maternal health. Ancient Song Dual Services, a Brooklyn-based organization, has actively worked towards bridging racial disparities in maternal health towards addressing racial implicit bias since 2008. Um, Chanel actually started Ancient Song out of her living room, and 10 years later, here we are. Um, she saw that there was a need to address um, access to care, so since then, Ancient Song has trained over 300 doulas, including myself, both locally and nationally. Um, we are a community-based and culturally re relevant organization, uh, and we are crucial in spearheading the fight against the disparities in black maternal mortality and morbidity. morbidity excuse me. Ancient Strong stands here in favor of the package of bills coined as the Mother's Day package, offering both lactation services and accommodations, as well as in support of diapers and childhood expenses, because just like doula services, diapers should not be seen as a luxury. <clears throat> 
but we would also like to stress the importance of community-based and culturally relevant organizations who have been and still are at the forefront of maternal health work within our communities, being not only included but recognized as key resources in informing the earliest phase of this work and improving the outcomes of postpartum period for those individuals and families most at risk. Certified lactation counselors, I am one of those, by the way. <laughs> um, additionally, should be regarded as an integral part of supporting lactation for employees in order to foster con continuity and both physical and emotional support in lactation. In order to effectively address racial disparities within maternal health care in New York City and statewide, we must also ensure that the community voices and representations are stakeholders in any develop development towards health equity. This in itself plays an integral role in addressing the maternal mort mortality and severe morbidity, morbidity of black women in working within our city. Black women are four times more likely to die in the U.S. and 12 times more likely to die of childbirth and um, childbirth-related um, causes in, in New York City. New York City. New York City should be regarded as the prime example in facilitating what it means to have equitable partnership in addressing disparities within our most marginalized communities. The Maternal Mortality Review Board is already taking the ad adequate steps towards addressing maternal deaths by having Ancient Song and other community organizations steering conversations and providing information to adequately address maternal deaths. The Maternal Mortality <coughs> Review Board, as proposed by the New York Assembly, includes a section that would- Wrap it up, but you're doing great. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, try saying that three times. Mortal, mort um, mortality Review Board, as proposed by the New York Assembly, includes a section that will compromise confidentiality protection that is not only actively required by all states, but is also considered crucial by the CDC. The section must be revised in order to protect the confidentiality of, uh, confidentiality of our mothers. The new language proposed within this state's initiative not only breaches confidentiality, but also safety of those groups. Thank you for all your time and energy, and thank you in advance for supporting. We look forward to shifting the narrative of pregnant and birthing people in New York City. Thank you, and thank you for testifying on behalf of Chanel, and thank you for being a doula. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Next. Good afternoon, Chair Rosenthal, and Chair Cabrana, and the members of the committee. My name is Alice Nguyen. I'm the Chief of Policy of the National Diaper Bank Network. We're a network of three, uh, 200 diaper banks across the country. Diaper banks provide diapers through uh, to poor and um, low-income families through community-based agencies, in most cases, they don't, we don't receive any government funding, um, and the need, as we've already heard, is, is quite great. Two of our members um, here in the city have been mentioned, the Hope Line and uh, the Good Plus Foundation. But you can, as you can imagine, getting diaper banks in, in New York is, is fairly challenging because of the cost of, of um, warehousing diapers and, and distributions. So we fully support this bill as a way of getting more diapers out to more families more easily. Uh, diapers are important for both children and their family. An insufficient supply of diapers can increase um, the risk of severe diaper rash and infection, causing parents to take time off from work for, to care for sick children. But also parents of healthy children can have a problem with diapers if they don't have enough diapers to provide for the child care program. Last summer we surveyed families across the U.S. and found that one in three families suffers from diaper need, the inability to, to, to provide enough diapers to keep their child clean, healthy, and dry. 57% of parents in diaper need said that they, they miss work or school at least once during the year, bef the month before, because of diapers, 57 percent. Um, di providing diapers makes real economic difference. Uh, an, ana an analysis at the um, University of Connecticut Center of Economic Analysis um, that the Sergeant of Arms has passed out um, among you. Providing diapers reduced the risk of the reduced the incidence of diaper rash 33 percent, and the duration of diaper rash 77 percent causing real medical savings um, over for diaper rash um, medical costs. The study also made, estimated, because diapers can help parents go to work and stay at work, that the earnings of the recipient families increased 11 times the value of the diapers they received. Uh, these increased earnings, of course, added to the state revenue um, and, and more income tax um, and uh, sales tax. Diaper need is strongly correlated um, with maternal stress. It needs a stronger correlation between maternal, um, between diaper need and maternal stress than any other basic need, including food and security. Not being able to provide diapers um, for your child causes stress, and stressed families have difficult caring for their children, exacerbating the situation. 
With this bill, families under stress can provide this most basic need for their children. Small things like diapers can have a big impact on the physical, mental, and economic well-being of the children and family. We fully support this bill and urge you to support it. Thank you. Great. Really appreciate everyone's testimony and everyone's work on behalf of our mothers and children. Thank you for your work. I see there are no council members besides the two of us. We care. Um, I'm going to call up the next panel. Thank you again. Next, we have Olga Rodriguez from Safe Horizon, Ashley Sawyer from Girls for Gender Equity, Sarah Braffman from A Better Balance. Nice to see you. Nice to see that you waited here. And um, Alice, I can't quite read your last name from Citizens Committee of Children. Are you here? OK, sorry, I couldn't. You'll pronounce it for me. All right. If you have testimony, you can give it to the sergeant. And um, I'm going to ask you to just introduce yourself uh, before giving your testimony. And um, Alice, only because you're sitting down last, sure. maybe you could start. Just be sure to turn on the microphone so the red light shows. And we're going to keep the three-minute um, uh, limit for testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Alice Bufkin. I'm the Director of Policy for Child and Adolescent Health with the Citizens Committee for Children. We're an independent, multi-issue child advocacy organization dedicated to ensuring that every New York child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. I'd first like to thank Chair Rosenthal, Chair Cabrera, the members of the committee, um, and public advocate James. Um, I'm going to interrupt you just for a quick sec. If you want, you can just talk about, we have copies of your mm -hmm. testimony. You're welcome to read it into the record, or you're welcome to make some general comments as well. Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, so I do want to, um, you know, we as a multi-issue advocacy organization appreciate the full package of the Mother's Day bills today, are very supportive of the, the intent of all of these bills. Um, I first want to address uh, intro 380 related to the diaper supply. Um, you know, we've heard today extensively about how important diapers are and how difficult they are to, uh, for families to afford. Um, CC thus strongly supports intro 380, but we do have a few recommendations to further improve the bill. Uh, first, in addition to providing diapers, we'd like to um, ask the council to consider also providing a supply or having DCAS provide a supply of um, baby wipes and washcloths. Um, these are also items, as you know, are very difficult for families to obtain, um, and so we'd like to, to consider adding that to the diaper supply as well. Um, additionally, many infants and toddlers are in, su in subsidized childcare or in family childcare settings rather than in uh, center-based settings. Um, and so we would ask that the council explore the feasibility of providing diapers in these family-based settings in addition to center settings. Um, this could potentially take the format of a um, reimbursement uh, for uh, diapers purchased and supplied. Um, we also strongly support intro 853. Um, we believe that a uh, plan to ensure city workers have access to high quality affordable childcare is long overdue. Um, as you know, a lot of uh, city agencies have a high number of female employees, so we'd love to see the pilot study uh, in particular work with one of the agencies that has a high number of female employees within it. Um, we also obviously very much appreciate the council for focusing attention on how to improve breastfeeding supports in New York City um, and appreciate DOHMH for its extensive work on this area. Um, despite these efforts, we've heard again how we still have a long way to go as a city. Um, so we very much support the intent of intro 879 and intro 905. Um, we do echo the comments earlier today of wanting to make sure that those do ultimately expand the protections available for, for working moms. Um, but again, we, we very much appreciate increasing accommodations and increasing um, the education and the knowledge of employees about what's out there and what's available to them. In general, we would just say that um, with all these lactation uh, accommodations, um, always we want to make sure that we are also looking at the broader culture of support for breastfeeding. So making sure that these things go hand in hand with a, an opportunity to support um, breastfeeding as, as uh, promoted, as welcome, as celebrated, in addition to making sure that there is private space for these moms. Um, again, we're incredibly grateful to the City Council for looking at these and appreciate your time today. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Rosenthal and Chair Cabrera. My name is Ashley Sawyer, and I'm the Director of Policy and Government Relations at Girls for Gender Equity. Girls for Gender Equity, GGE, is a youth development and advocacy organization committed to the physical, psychological, social, economic development of girls and women, 
and we're committed to fighting structural forces, including racism, sexism, transphobia, homophobia, and economic inequity, which constrict the freedom of cisgender and transgender girls and women of color and gender nonconforming people of color. Thank you for holding this important hearing on this uh, package of bills addressing the needs of many parents in the city of New York. Last term, we worked with many of you to launch the first dedicated initiative for cis and trans girls and women and gender nonconforming youth, the New York City Young Women's Initiative. A number of issues being addressed today were recommended by this body in 2016, and we appreciate the leadership of the City Council to continue to prioritize women, girls, and gender nonconforming folks in our city. Safe, clean, accessible, and comfortable lactation spaces are an important step in removing barriers that prevent all breastfeeding parents, but especially parents of color from breastfeeding. As you all heard today, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists highly recommend breastfeeding for the first six months and primarily um, exclusively for the first six months. And despite all of the evidence that you all heard about today about the benefits of breastfeeding for both parent and child, we know that there are still significant structural impediments that prevent parents of color from breastfeeding or pumping. And the CDC has also indicated that many of those barriers are related to people who have work in low wage jobs and work in small employers that do not accommodate them. At GGE, because we focus on youth and young people, I want to particularly emphasize the way this package of bills can benefit young people who are parenting in schools. We can understand that the barriers exist for pa parents who are in a traditional workplace, so you can only imagine the barriers that exist for a young person who is trying to breastfeed while attending a New York City public school. In 2016, GGE launched a participatory action research process where we engaged over 100 young people attending New York City schools to better understand the specific needs and concerns that they had. Those young people compiled 45 recommendations for the city in the report entitled Schools Girls Deserve, as you may recall. We know that from that Schools Girls Deserve report and the participatory action research that came from it, that not being able to care for children if you're a student is one of the main contributors to push out for students, pregnant and parenting students in New York City schools. And so we ask that this bill and this package of bills emphasize the ways that school personnel should allow breastfeeding students to take breaks or pump or otherwise express milk. And students should not, should be able to, excuse me, should be able to do so in spaces that do not subject them to stigma or embarrassment, and students should also have access to refrigeration. I'll quickly speed up. As an attorney, I represented young people who um, were in New York City jails and girls and female identified folks on Rikers, and I was had, had extensive conversations with them about the trauma of being separated from their children. And for that reason, I'd also emphasize the way that this package should support folks who are in New York City detention facilities and jails in being able to breastfeed and express milk. You can only imagine what it's like to stand next to a woman who's in court, who's engorged and is in extreme pain, and how that can prohibit her from um, having a fair day in court. So we thank you again for your leadership around these issues and we hope that you all will continue the process to ensure that um, breastfeeding parents and children are able to have the resources and the support that they need. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, uh, especially your emphasis on the courts and on the jails. Great point. Hi, my name is Sarah Brofman. I am a staff attorney at A Better Balance, which is an organization, um, a legal advocacy organization that works to um, further the law for working families. Um, we have been proud to work with the city council and public advocate James in advancing many pioneering solutions um, for this city, including the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act and the city human rights law, also known as the PWFA. Beyond just working closely to pass the law, our organization has an emphasis on enforcement. Since the 2014 passage of the PWFA, we have spoken to hundreds, if not thousands, of workers in New York City through our free confidential legal helpline about their rights under the law, including their right to receive lactation accommodations as a related medical condition to pregnancy and childbirth. While my written testimony focuses on three bills at issue today, including 853, 879, and 905, I want to focus on the two bills related to lactation accommodations, intro 879 and 905. While we certainly support the council's desire to ensure working parents can access lactation spaces, 
We're concerned that the legislation as written would actually curtail rights already granted under the PWFA and create confusion for employers and employees. I'm going to lay out three concerns with 879 and two concerns with 905. First and foremost, as has been pointed out, Intro 879 would codify in statute that only employers with 15 or more employees would be required to provide a lactation space. This could preempt the current four employee threshold made clear by the commission guidance, stripping employees who work for employers with fewer than 15 employees of lactation accommodations. Second, the law currently requires that employers accommodate employees when a related medical condition is known or should have been known to the employer. This means that an employer must accommodate even when the employee has not affirmatively requested the accommodation. 879, however, places the affirmative burden on the employee to request the accommodation. Finally, 879 allows employers located in the same building to share a lactation space. We are concerned about the administrability of this provision. Allowing employers to combine spaces could result in employees being unable to access a space that is not operated by their employer. For an employee who needs to express milk on a regular schedule, this could result in not only inconvenience, but also a risk to the employee's health. As to 905, our concerns are twofold. In January 2018, the mayor signed into law Intro 804A, which amended the human rights law to require that employers engage in a cooperative dialogue with employees who request reasonable accommodations, including lactation accommodations. The cooperative dialogue standard requires employers to one, engage in good faith in reasonable time, and again, and places the burden, again, to request the accommodation on both the employer and the employee. Intro 905, however, does not have a good faith requirement, allows the employer up to five business days to grant the request as opposed to reasonable time, and again, only puts the burden on the employee to request the accommodation. Finally, we're concerned that this will place an unnecessary burden on the commission to create a model policies when materials are already available from the commission setting forth employers' obligations. The city just adopted a budget cutting the commission's budget by nearly 10% and the commission, or $1.4 million. And the commission is now tasked with implementing the, both the cooperative dialogue and the recent gender-based harassment laws. It seems unnecessarily onerous to make the commission create another policy that is redundant. While the lactation laws could certainly be strengthened, we urge the council to consider our feedback on 879 and 905 and to consider the confusion these laws may cause workers and employers, leading to a potential reduction in workers' access to lactation accommodations. We would be happy to lend our expertise and answer questions on these issues to ensure that these protections work for all New Yorkers. Thank you. Really appreciate your help, and this is exactly what the legislative process and the back and forth is about. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Olga Rodriguez Baidal, and I am the Associate Vice President of Shelters for Safe Horizon. Uh, Safe Horizon is the nation's leading victims assistance organization in New York City uh, and the largest provider of services to victims of crime. Uh, Safe Horizon's mission is to provide support, prevent violence, and promote justice for victims of crime, abuse, their families, and the communities they live in. Uh, Safe Horizon strongly supports Intro 380, as diapers are a basic necessity of every family and should be readily available for families in need. Access to clean diapers for families in our domestic violence shelters would mean that they could direct their financial resources to other basic necessities like food, clothing, transportation, and that Safe Horizon could direct resources to other essential services for survivors. Safe Horizon operates eight domestic violence shelters across all five boroughs, and we provide a safe healing setting for over 700 uh, people each night. Uh, more than half of the families that we serve are children. Uh, the families in our domestic violence shelters want the best for their children, as we all do, but have very limited financial resources. An average monthly supply of diapers costs about $80. Uh, and families living in our shelters must often sacrifice uh, and, uh, and make choices between basic necessities like food, clothing, transportation, medical care, um, and diapers. No parent should have to choose between purchasing diapers and meeting the basic needs of their children. 
For families who are living in domestic violence shelters, access to clean diapers means that they can budget their resources towards other essential needs and that there is one less thing for them to worry about as they work to rebuild their lives and focus on safety. Additionally, regular access to clean diapers ensures that children are healthy and avoid the health risks that come with staying in a soiled diaper, diaper for a long period of time. Safe Horizon will occasionally be able to offer diapers to families on an emergency basis, but current reimbursement rates for our domestic violence shelters do not allow us to provide diapers on a full-time basis, which is what families really need. Intro 380 could help Safe Horizon to direct the current funds we use to purchase emergency diapers to other resources for shelter residents like food, transportation, uh, and uh, different kinds of assistance. Additionally, Safe Horizon will occasionally receive donations of diapers that we can distribute to families, but these donations are not always, uh, sorry, will occasionally receive donations of diapers that we can distribute to our families, but these donations are not always consistent, so our families cannot depend on that. Having a steady supply of diapers will allow families and Safe Horizon staff to plan a better and direct critical resources to what is most needed. Um, Do you wanna wrap up, I and mean, we have your testimony. Sure, so I just wanted to say that earlier on we heard uh, you know, someone testify about um, you know, providing diapers to uh, organizations and uh, as far as I know, there really aren't a lot of resources that we can direct clients to. Oftentimes, if clients are in need, we can provide an emergency basis. There are other programs that can provide diapers, but it's usually a one-off. It's not a resource that is ongoing. And so I just wanna say that um, this is really important, and I, and I hope that um, it comes to fruition. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate it. I mean, I thought that the um, information from the diaper network mm -hmm. was really interesting. That might be a resource, but I really appreciate everyone on the panel here. I know Council Member Yeager has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question uh, for Ms. Brofman. Uh, I don't know if you were here earlier when I was uh, talking to the fine people from uh, the Human Rights Commission. I'm gonna ask you the same question. What's the right number? So the standard in the cooperative dialogue law is a reasonable time. And I think that that's appropriate because if you have someone who you know is coming back to work, oftentimes women will actually alert their employer beforehand, and so they really only need a much shorter amount of time in order to create that accommodation than putting five days in the law might actually give employers the thought that, well, I can actually drag this out unnecessarily when really you have someone that needs to express milk every three hours or possibly more. And so our concern is that changing it from a reasonable time, which actually could be an hour or a day, to five days is going to really compromise the health and safety Who of Who determines workers. what's a reasonable time? Well, first, the dialogue happens among the employer and employee. And then a reasonable time, if it becomes an issue, becomes the determination of the, the Human Rights Commission or of a, of a court, if you take it to court. And I think oh. you'd see with, especially around lactation, that often it doesn't take five days to create that kind of accommodation. And you're talking about workers that really need this in real time. So five days could actually push them off the job without employment. If an employer has to do this within five days, right, and a reasonable time could be an hour, is there a likelihood in your view that in the city of New York we're going to have this, this great uh, number of employers who are gonna say, well, I can do it in an hour, but let me wait out the five days? Is there some kind of a benefit to those employers that you see that they would wait five days in order to do it? So I talk to workers day in and day out, and if employers can put off following the law, they will. We just had a client who's, who told her employer she needed break time to express milk at work. Her employer put in writing, she found when she got back, I don't feel like following this law. 
So she got back, she needed break time to pump, her employer didn't want to follow the law, and she was fired days after she came back from maternity leave. And that's a great example of an employer who would be in violation of this law as well. They would be in violation of this law, but they'd also, they're also currently in violation of our current law. But they would also be in violation of this law. What I'm looking to find is an example of somebody who would currently be in violation of the law as currently interpreted by the fine people at the Human Rights Commission, but would somehow get a free pass under the wise legislation being proposed by this body. Sure. So let's say you have an employer who has a space available but doesn't want to give it to the employee and they say and so the employee says okay I need I need the space and they have it available and they need it within one day and the employer says well I actually have five days and so the employee goes home doesn't get to express milk loses time loses money from not being at work under this law though the employer might not be liable under the cooperative dialogue law reasonable time would show that the employer should have complied with the law within the day. But now the law says it actually only needs five, they actually can take five days it's to comply your, with the law. So now your law, which preempts the cooperative dialogue law because it's more on point with lactation accommodations, has now curbed their ability to bring a claim because it's gone from reasonable time to five days. But it, it, that's your interpretation of what would be reasonable and that employer in somebody else's interpretation could have done it in one day, could have done it in two hours. But what we're saying is that there's a cap. There's five days. Employers are going to know that they have to do this within five days. If they can do it within four days, I don't think an employer, I mean, I don't think most employers would say, well, let me wait that extra day. There's no cost involved or no savings involved in waiting the extra day versus doing it in four or three or two. And what we're trying to do, I think, uh, the wise drafters of this bill, is create some certainty in the law versus the interpretation or the whims of an agency. And you saw that uh, with regard to the other agency, I had the same concerns. What I'm trying to do, and I think some of my colleagues on this council are trying to do, is to take out uncertainties in the law. As a lawyer, you know that we don't like uncertainties. We like people to know what the rules and regs are and how to follow them. And what the current rules and regs are is that the commission gets to decide what the employer could have done, whether or not it was reasonable, and whether or not the employer unduly delayed it, and uh, which brings me to my next point, unless you want to jump in, because you look like you wanted to. Sure, so can I jump in with yeah, yeah, two Yeah, yeah, please, please, please. If we talk about clarity in the law, the, you'll have two conflicting laws, right? So you'll have a cooperative dialogue law, and then you'll have a lactation accommodation law. One will say reasonable time, one will say up to five days. So that is number one as to something that could yes, create but confusion. You, but you know that on statutory one. interpretation, this law will govern uh, 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 issues related specifically to lactation. Right, so okay. to, to the second Supreme point. Court's very clear that this is exactly the kind of uh, legislation that would that would you know the two comparisons of the uh, the comparison of the two legislation this legislation would clearly trump the other because this speaks to the point and is specific versus the other legislation which is a general legislation so Supreme Court's very clear that this bill would govern there's no this there's no unclarity there's no confusion there's no uh, uh, um, uh, trumping or or kind of uh, um, you know conflicting two statutes Yes, so okay. can I make two points sure, on that? Sure, sure. Um, one, I think, is a point of compromise, and, and one, um, maybe not a point of compromise. Um, but the, on the point of compromise, I would say, if, if the intent really is to make a cap, right, that five days is really the cap, but if they can do it sooner, then we should do it sooner, then I would, I would want to think about this more, but just offhand, to put something in the law that says, you know, without delay, within reasonable time, up to, five days only. Okay, right? well that's the answer so, that the Human Rights Commission could not give, and I appreciate that. So I think that that's a way to, to think about it. Okay. The, the other thing I would say, though, is that one has to remember that the, the PWFA is about pregnancy, childbirth, and related medical conditions. So someone who comes back and needs to express milk may have other accommodations related to childbirth or medical condition that aren't the need to express milk. So then you are continuing to have confusion in the law because the reasonable time standard would still exist for the other accommodations related to pregnancy, childbirth, and related medical conditions, and then a separate standard for the lactation space. 
So you're still giving employers a confusing standard because if they're weighing two kinds of accommodations, one related to lactation and one related to, let's say, it was a really difficult birth and the person needs a, a new chair or needs to take more frequent breaks because um, they are still recovering from childbirth three months later, then they're seeking an accommodation for that as well as expressing milk, and there are two different standards set out and for both of those kinds of accommodations. No, no conflict because this, is, this law is specifically drafted to deal with lactation policy of the city of New York as articulated by its legislature. And what you're describing are reasonable accommodations related to medical conditions, which are not just limited to medical conditions related to pregnancy, but medical conditions across the board if somebody breaks a leg uh, is, an al is also entitled to reasonable accommodations at their place of employment, I believe. Um, I want to ask you another question uh, regarding the, the point that you brought up um, of the known or should have known standard. And my question is going to be, is it ever appropriate for an employer to ask an employee, are you currently expressing milk? So the commission contemplates that kind of scenario. And what the commission's guidance says, and I'm not quoting verbatim, so apologies if, if I make an error, but what they say is that if an employer knows that, uh, that an employee um, may be in need of an accommodation, and that accommodation is related to pregnancy, childbirth, and related medical conditions, then they would have the responsibility to ask if they needed an accommodation. And so I think if someone is out on parental leave and then they're coming back and they need to express milk at work, to say to someone, will you require lactation accommodations when you return? because they know that the person might have a condition related to pregnancy and childbirth, and that condition is lactation, then to ask if they need a space for that, then I think that would be appropriate. And the other thing is that employees sometimes have fear of asking for such a space because they fear retaliation. Now, the, the council is considering a current law that would put request for re reasonable accommodations within the anti-retaliation provision of the New York City human rights law. I testified on that yesterday, um, but I think employees... I co-sponsor that bill. That's wonderful. With thank Germani. you. Yes, and it's um, a good bill. It's a really good bill, um, and I thank you for that. At the same time, employees are still likely to fear retaliation for requesting accommodations. So if the, if the employer reaches out and knows my employee is going to need lactation accommodations, then it, it really alleviates a burden on the employee who might have fear of asking for those accommodations. Let me, let me give you this scenario. Um, obviously, we're here on a... On a a female-friendly legislative day, uh, and it's about time, and, and Helen, uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, has been a leader on that in this council. Um, I don't have the, uh, the burdens of that, obviously, uh, because I'm not a female. But I can tell you that as a male, I would never feel comfortable asking a woman who worked for me uh, whether or not she was currently expressing milk. I wouldn't think that that's an appropriate thing for me to ask. I'm a married guy, and I, I'm comfortable with, with my personal relationships with my staff, but I don't think it's appropriate for somebody to turn to their staffer and say, I know you just had a baby. Are you lactating? And, and I think what we're doing here is we're setting up a situation where we're, where we're requiring the employers to tell employees what their rights are, but we're asking the employee to say, I need this accommodation. That's normal. That's standard. And that's in every kind of accommodation that employees need. But it also takes the burden away from this confusion where an employer may say, you know, on the one hand, I, I, I got to know because she just had a baby. This may be a thing. But on the other hand, I don't want to ask that because it's not my business necessarily. Well, then what I would implore you to do is to ask every parent who is coming back from a parental leave whether they require lactation accommodations. Then you're not assuming someone's gender, you're not assuming someone's gender identity, you're not assuming whether they might need lactation accommodations, and you're not assuming whether a woman would need accommoda accommodations. You send out an email to every standard fare, every employee who is returning to work from a parental leave who has a new child, whether it be adopted, foster, you know, biological, do you require lactation accommodations when you return to the workplace? And then you're not in a position where you're uncomfortable because that's just standard fare that as an employer you're going to ask whether you require lactation accommodations when you return from parental leave. Councilmember Rivera's bill, uh, Rivera Combo, uh, Councilman Powers and Councilman Rayella, uh, uh, have a bill that uh, requires a written policy 
by the employer that be distributed, that the employer is as affirmatively telling their staff, we will do this for you, you just gotta tell us you want it done. And I don't see, respectfully, I don't see what the problem with that would be. Um, and it takes, again, it takes away the uncertainty. It takes away the confusion and it re doesn't require a guesswork and it doesn't require uncomfortable conversations uh, or confrontations or whatever. It puts everything out there as a firm policy of the city of New York. The employer has to put it in writing, has to tell the employees what their rights are, just like in your place of employment, I'm sure in the, in the coffee room, there's a whole bulletin board full of employee rights. You have the right to unemployment if you're terminated. You have the right to disability. There's all these things that the state law requires and that city law requires. This would be another such policy. And that's, I mean, it's a matter of explaining it to you of what the thinking was behind it, but that's the thinking here. We want to do it better. There's no question we want to make it easier, but what we're also trying to do is create certainty in the law where uncertainty is right now. So two points on that. One, I just want to re-emphasize the idea that when anyone returns from parental leave, you put out a query as to whether they need lactation accommodations. Then you're not put in the uncomfortable position of needing to ask a woman specifically whether they need lactation accommodations. What about a new employee? Just, just hired a woman. Do we ask the woman whether or not she's currently lactating and needs accommodations? Well, you're going to be a new employee. You would be giving the model policy, so you would be letting them know that they have the right to lactation accommodations. And we would be giving that to existing employees as well. The second, the second point I want to make re respectfully is that when, a, when an employee sits down and receives a policy, if it doesn't affect their life, they likely, while we think it's important, I, I support legislation that would require a policy with the provisos that I made um, in my testimony. At the same time, someone who doesn't have that need in that moment is not going to remember that three years later when they actually require the accommodation. And so what I would say to that is we need the policy. It needs to be on the books. I fully support it and our organization fully supports it. At the same time, I hear from, from callers and women every day only when the need arises do they want to know what their rights are and they might have received a policy. I can't tell you how many times someone might have said to me, oh yeah, I might have seen something when I was hired three years ago, but I have no idea what that says. I don't know how to access it and I don't know what my rights are. And so giving an employer the responsibility to say, you know, when the need arises that you have this right is gonna be much more practically effective for an employee, much more so than a, a form of paper they got along with 300 other pieces of paper on their first day of work saying they have the right to this, that, and the other. And I think going back to the point of just treating it neutrally where everyone who is returning from parental leave gets a notification that if you require lactation accommodations, please let me know. That's not making an assumption as to whether they are or are not expressing milk. It's just telling them, we know you are a new parent. We're not assuming what your needs are, and we have this available to you should you need it. Well, I appreciate the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so Chair. much, Thank you, um, Council Member Yeager. Really appreciate that. But also, I really appreciate this panel. Thank you for your thoughts on this, um, these, these pieces of legislation. Thank you for staying so late today. Um, uh, Council Member Cabrera, I think I'm gonna call the hearing. Okay, I'm gonna call this hearing to a close. Thank you. Thank you.